as like this. I just realized I was uh, I was like I realized I was making pager jokes. Then I realized like maybe most of you don't know what a pager is, so I was making jokes to myself. For those of you that know what a pager is, like you get my joke, yeah. Uh, so hi, I'm Min. Uh, I am incredibly um, uh, happy to be here uh, and very privileged to also be asked to help to um, share my knowledge with you guys uh, and ladies. Um, I'm just going to use guys. If anyone wants me to change, tell me, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, to share with all of you here today, uh, I'm also very happy to be like, assisted by so many great people. Um, I am not the one with the most knowledge, just not for sure. I'm probably just the most... Um, not Paisei person, so I don't mind standing here before all of you today. Um, collectively, we have a lot of knowledge in the room. Uh, please reach out to the teaching assistants as well. This is your best opportunity to get very good attention from somebody. Like, on what other occasions can you just go up to someone and say, hey, this doesn't work, can you help me? It, it, it's very rare, so make full use of this opportunity today. We have like maybe four and a half hours more. We have the boot camp coming out in the future. We have uh, next week, we have the code clinic. Take this opportunity to learn. Uh, I'm just going to be very upfront and tell you, like, uh, if, if you're new to programming and you're new to JavaScript, you're going to feel very uncomfortable. You're going to find that everything is, is so hard to grasp, intuitively speaking. You're like, all right, this kind of makes sense, but I don't get it. Because it's pretty much like learning a brand new language. It's like learning a brand new area. Your brain needs to get exposed to it multiple times before it finally clicks. And when it clicks, it's wonderful. Yeah, so you just kind of have to persist at it. Um, does anyone here have a comp science background, for example? No? So I don't have a comp science background either. I'm a mid-career switcher. I used to study like management, strategy, finance stuff. Uh, I, I went up to a master's and I decided like this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. Uh, I really liked programming when I was younger, so I decided to go back into it. But let me tell you that the change was both great, smooth, and also really, really painful. So when I first started learning programming, um, I, I started when I was younger, but there was a different version of JavaScript and all that, and the ecosystem is very different now. Like The ecosystem in 2019 is extremely different than what you would expect when you were meddling around with something maybe 10, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, around that, you know? So um, you need to understand that nowadays things are very community-driven, uh, knowledge is very shared, uh, you have to be unafraid to search for the answers. The most important thing is being uh, persistent and learning how to find your answers. That is extremely important. Um, I'm not ashamed. I mean, I've never shared this with anyone else other than my partner. But I'm not ashamed to say, like, when I started making this switch into making a full-time job, I cried twice when I was learning how to program. Like, I literally just bawled my eyes out. Because um, I'm not particularly smart. But I tend to pick up things pretty easily on most other topics on what I'm familiar with. So this was like a completely grey zone for me. Uh, I went into it, uh, I was trying to do stuff, and like two times I got so frustrated because I couldn't get something to work. Like I was trying to do something in web canvas and stuff. So I was basically trying to shoot above what my level was. I was very frustrated because I was always very used to being able to jump very fast. I went into it. Uh, I kept trying to do it. I was like, why don't I understand this? Why can't I get it? Why can't I get my code to work? And like, on two different occasions, I just burst out into tears and bawled for an hour, for example. Like, I was genuinely very, very frustrated with myself. But looking back on hindsight, it's because I set expectations way too high for myself. Uh, I need to learn how to celebrate the little victories every single time I learn something new. Even now on my path, I've only professionally been doing this for like three, three plus years. Almost four, three, four years. So. Every time I learn something new, it's a little victory and I celebrate it, I appreciate it, I go back and try to learn the same thing again. So the path might not be easy, but remember that this is not, um, this is something that you have to say, hey, I want this, you dedicate yourself to it. You, when you persevere it, you will get it. Eventually you will get it. Just, so I just want to share this because um, I think this is not so much more than just like, um, coming here for me to run through some exercises with you, you can easily do that online. There are so many courses you can do, uh, things like that. But it is just to tell you that this journey has been shared by so many people everywhere. Uh, you're not alone, especially with tech ladies, you're not alone at all. Um, so take the opportunity, learn, get frustrated, learn to cope with your emotions, learn not to destroy your computer, learn not to toss your computer on the floor in the beginning. Why is this not working? It's like, and then like, don't say my computer sucks, you know, stuff like that. 
learn to manage your emotions, take a step back and come back with a fresh mind the next day, for example. And your mind might click, the way you think might click, the, the, the things change. And when you're in a calm and um, a very good state of mind and not frustrated with yourself, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking about this topic because we're ladies, but it's just because we're human beings and we have emotions. And when you're programming in the beginning, your ego and your emotions will block you to finding the solutions most of the time. Ego, for example, by not reaching out to other people. Ego by not uh, accepting that I don't know this topic and I need to go and find it. Um, and then your emotions, because emotions is the one that threatens you. And when you are fearful and you are scared, you run away from the situation. So then you run away from coding. You run away from programming. You run away from getting better. You run away from what you thought you wanted. So, um, and being here today, I just wanted to share a bit more or so about the area outside of programming, outside of just this language called JavaScript, uh, because for those, you can easily go online. So please feel free to ask me any questions you like, um, whether or not it's regarding the topic, about my experience as a software engineer, or how I learn stuff, things like that. Just feel free to ask anything. I'm very open to you today. Um, I will start with personal thing. Uh, I have three cats and a dog, OK? OK. Do you see me typing my password? You know my password length? Oh, God. Ah, this is the part of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, so feel free to cut me when I'm running across time, because I know we need to be very conscientious of time. There's a lot of things we want to cover today. The idea is not so much that you come in and become like an expert in JavaScript in just a couple of hours, because unless you're a super genius, that's not going to happen. Like, and there are only so many super geniuses in the world. Um, a lot of you might start to grab things, but you will still make mess up on other areas. You might feel confident in some, less confident in others. What I want to do is to show you what JavaScript um, is about in this modern environment, modern JavaScript. So there is like an ecosystem around it, there are tools around it, there are ways to, uh, that the language evolves and things like this. So don't feel frustrated if you cannot follow everything that is done today. As long as you manage to get through all the lessons, like that's huge kudos to you guys already. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll basically be doing an introduction on this, uh, JavaScript and also something called Node.js. Uh, my name is Min Ong, in case you haven't mentioned, and I'm on Twitter at Ong Min. You can feel free to reach me. Uh, I'm a bit sloppy with notifications, but I try my best. I have so many chat apps, it's crazy. <laughs> So like, like what I was saying just now, like what do you get yourselves into? Like some of you might be sitting in this room like thinking, oh my god, what am I doing here on a Saturday afternoon? I can be like out hanging out with friends, I can be doing stuff. What am I getting myself into? But you're getting yourself into like gathering new knowledge and like having a lot of fun, to be honest. Like even if you don't want to become a professional software programmer in the future, um, you can do a lot of things with JavaScript and, and it will be very helpful in your life. It might even help you in your work, you know? Well, you probably would use something else like Python, but you know. The, the, the thinking, it helps. So you have nothing to fear because all of us are here today to help you uh, work through this. And uh, yeah, so uh, nothing to fear, Coda Kitty is here. So usually when I get like, um, I need to chill out a little bit, my cat hangs out with me when it's coding. <laughs> so right now you might not get that joke, but you'll get it later. If you've ever worked at NPM, then you know sometimes it takes forever to install stuff. So. <laughs> Yeah, and that's really my cat, not the internet. Uh, so what are we covering today? I won't go too much into depth into the history of JavaScript because you can read all those things, but just to really talk a little bit about it. And then also we'll be doing two things. Uh, JavaScript is a language that is uh, multi I, I will If there are any words I say that you don't understand, feel free to ask the TAs, ask me, Google, stuff like that. So JavaScript is very, I'll call it flexible. Uh, why it gets a lot of hate sometimes from people who have more traditional um, computer science backgrounds. Um, it was uh, created in like maybe 10 days, something like that. Um, 
and then the web just took off <laughs> running with it and now you can't get rid of JavaScript. It's really important. If you go and look at all the adoption rates, the number of repos and stuff that's written in JavaScript, it's a, it's, a really, uh, it's, a really, it's a really a good time for JavaScript right now. And there's also a community of people trying to make it into a stronger language, uh, more multi-purpose, used everywhere. So we'll be trying to cover it to let you know, traditionally JavaScript began in the browser, but now you can use it on the server side as well, which makes it very exciting. So um, we'll just be walking through with you a, a few things, concepts of using JavaScript on, on the web, for example, as well as then using it on the back end, what you call back end, which I'll demystify a bit later. So first, a bit of story time. As you can tell, I like to tell stories. <laughs> okay, so uh, how many of you have heard of Java? Do, at least don't feel shy, you know, like, I do my best to not feel shy about standing in front of everyone. Okay, so we'll get someone. Um, so you're gonna hear commonly when you say, oh yeah, I'm learning JavaScript, I'm writing JavaScript, people, some, like, some people without the background might say, oh, Java, I know that, you know, stuff like that. I just want to emphasize before we begin today, Java and JavaScript, are distinctly different things, distinct, they are completely different languages, they just share the same name. So I, like, I love the analogy when I began, a ham is, is to a hamster, is Java is to JavaScript. It's completely different, okay? And you see Java used, for example, a lot in uh, enterprises, for instance. So the year was 1995. This guy called Brandon decided to make a language within 10 days. Um, so now we're, we're basically living off this language, the web you're on mostly is powered by this language. Um, your browsers all come with JavaScript in it. Um, that's why it's such an amazing language for the web. So the browsers can handle JavaScript very efficiently. Um, that, and this is a de facto language of web. So if web, so for some of you who are like graphic designers and already know a bit of jQuery and stuff, that, that is kind of the, maybe one of the strong reasons to learn this language because you can do a lot of things on the web with JavaScript. Uh, is, is the de facto language. Even though you'll hear like, people saying, oh, now there's something called Rust, and you can write all sorts of other language on it, JavaScript is still the thing where you can come and build something and run it on the web. Uh, it allows you to do things like making websites interactive. So whenever you're clicking something and like, something pops up or like, um, you change the, some, some toggles and something else changed on the page, that's mostly all JavaScript. You can do a bit of it with CSS, but that's a lot of JavaScript involved. Um, so basically, it runs in all browsers out of the box, whether it's uh, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, you know, it, it's in there. At different levels of support, this is the complication. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so anyways, just to give a strong over, uh, a bigger overview of generating these three simplistic concepts, um, last week we covered uh, HTML and CSS. So how I like to think about these three topics whenever I talk to someone new um, to, to programming. So I know we have a mixed audience today, so I'm gonna try to reach out to those that, if you're new to this, um, come along with the journey as well. And if you already know something, also be able to come along on the same journey today, okay? So HTML gives you structure, basically. It's like how you structure your, your page, things like that. There are elements in it, things called um, elements. Um, there are like, syntax, like, like you learned last week, called divs, uh, p, um, nav, main, stuff like that. Uh, and then there's CSS, which gives you a look and a little bit of interaction as well. Things like on mouse over, uh, on hover, and things. Uh, whereas for CSS, you also have um, like background images, you have colors, um, you can do animation. CSS is getting very, very powerful now. And then we have JavaScript. Um, which is basically the language that you use to do more stuff, you know, than not just something very uh, like saying, okay, changing color. So JavaScript gives you more control, more flexibility, uh, ability to do things. So I, I, I distill JavaScript into like one, two, three, okay? Uh, I might change my mind tomorrow on what the one, two, three is, but just to, uh, understand the concept a bit more of what this thing, this scripting language called JavaScript is. So um, JavaScript has different types of data. So you will see later, but basically code is at its um, main purpose, telling the computer what to do. That's it. When you're writing code, you're communicating with in a way that the computer understands what to do for you. Computer understands to open a new tab, computer understands to uh, load something, computer understands to compress the tab, 
uh, your, your images, things like that. Code is just a way of communicating. So it's like you learning a new language like Arabic, for you to learn French, for you to learn Hokkien, whatever language you want to learn. So to, tell, to be able to communicate with a set of people who understand this. So it's the same. You're trying to communicate with the machines on how to do something. So when you communicate, sometimes you need a few features, right? You need the ability to do things. You need the ability to explain what a, a thing is. So in that sense, like a group of objects, like, um, like we learn in school, liquids, solids, air, right? So you have solids, for example. But solids are a very broad concept. The ability to, for me to stand here is because this ground is solid, right? So you have that data thing, something called data types. So in, in programming, everything is kind of like information control, uh, information manipulation, information storage. That, it, that is what it is. Like behind all your computers and everything, it's just a bunch of like maybe binary codes doing stuff. So therefore, there are things called data types. Data types is a meaningful grouping of information, like numbers, booleans, which just represents true or false, uh, strings, which is basically, this is a string, for example. Yeah, yeah. You see a lot of strange things on my computer. <laughs> um, JavaScript, so JavaScript has different types of data types. Just remember this. You'll go more into detail later. It allows you to do things, to have interactions, to do calculations, to make your life easier. And you can run on both browsers and servers. So if you look at very like things that are dated from maybe more than like nine years ago or more, you might say, oh, they might say only like, oh, JavaScript is for the browser, blah, blah, blah. You can do stuff. But now you can use it on the servers as well because of Node.js. So I know there are some of you who are here to learn React. So you might be sitting in a room thinking like, ah, yeah, I know all of this already. La. I'm sorry if I use English and you don't understand. Ask, just ask me, OK? I know all of this already. I just want to learn React. But let me just tell you, like, when you master JavaScript, you will be able to do uh, React way better. OK? So React is like probably the facto most popular web framework library. <laughs> uh, library, not for, um, at the moment. So, but you'll see that in history, not all of them are accurate, but you know, these this are just a whole bunch of logos of other things that have come around. Libraries come and go, you know, like time and tide, it, it sweeps the ocean, shores, something like that. <laughs> so there are different waves, and now we're running on the React wave. So running along with React, there's also uh, older school things like, well, not older school, I'm so sorry, Ember developers, uh, like, like Ember, uh, there's Angular too, um, or even more now. It's very hard to keep track because things are constantly changing, which is one of the things I want you to take away with, with today. Because like today's knowledge, two years later, you got to update it. You know, things change all the time. People are involved; they want to change stuff. They have different opinions. So frameworks happen because people want to do things differently. So right now, the wave is React. Okay, so learn React, but also master JavaScript, and then you will have career longevity. Well, afterwards, you need to master other languages and other concepts, of course, not just JavaScript. But uh, I'm saying like. Frameworks come and go. Learn React, it's very good. I'm a professional React developer, not very professional sometimes. Um, but, <laughs> but basically, it will help you learn a lot more things. They come and they go. So we call this concept vanilla JavaScript, modern JavaScript. Vanilla just means plain vanilla. So JavaScript, it just works. Okay? And, and it's basically bread and butter for a software programmer, a web developer, not a software programmer. So uh, any of you know what the difference between a front and a back end is? Roughly, just like uh, Aga kind of knowledge. Is this, a, OK, who don't know what uh, front and back end is? Um, who is too shy to raise their hands? <laughs> <laughs> Irony is like, oh no, <laughs> doesn't make sense. OK, so anyway, if you want to put it, so today the idea is not to go through like a whole like, you know, computer science kind of thing. Um, the idea is just to, to give you concepts so that when you go into the world, into the internet, you can pick up things because you kind of understand the concepts. Remember, it's just re-emphasizing this. So front end is basically the things that are visible to you. You're looking at your laptop right now. The browsers you have open looking at my wonderful slides uh, is, is basically front end work. And then back end is where all, um, more powerful machines, or less powerful, more powerful machines, uh, do different things, such as serve your file to the internet in a very efficient way, um, uh, store your information, and things like that. So it's a very simplistic split. Don't, get, don't need to get too confused or, or too like, pedantic about like, what front end is, what a back end is, stuff like that. Just know that uh, 
Think of back end as the invisible things, the front end as the visible things. Yeah? So you hear things, you hear another concept, people say I'm a full stack developer. Some people are really good full stack developer, other times you're just kind of like a full stack developer. Uh, but it basically means someone who can do both front and back end. I call myself a 0 0.75 full stack developer <laughs> because my back end is kind of weak to be honest. Like, there's like a whole world out there that's also very interesting for you, waiting for you to explore in the future. But a more, yeah, more CS background would be very helpful. So the front end is a very front end and JavaScript together are very accessible languages for people who are new to programming. It's just a, a great place to begin, a great place to start, no matter where you want your career to be going. So the format today is um, for for me to preview a little bit about the topic first. Then you guys do the hands-on, the exercises, and then I will go into depth to ex in depth to explain. Because when you're reading the exercises or the the, the the lessons, you see a lot of new concepts. And every other line, like when I was learning, every other line I was like, what is this? What is this? What is this? And I'm just like, what? Boom, my brain exploded, you know? So don't try to grasp everything so much. It's like learning a language. You repeat, you, you learn something, you learn how to say a phrase, how are you, stuff like that. You just learn it first. And then later on, the decomposition of understanding each piece will come. Okay, so just run with it, follow the exercises. If you don't understand everything fully, that's fine. Uh, go back and look into it again when you're trying to build your apps for, uh, for next week or stuff like that. But then uh, after you try all these things, then I'll explain a bit more into the concepts. And if there's anything I didn't cover, feel free to raise your hands. Feel free, if you prefer more privately, to ask the TAs. Uh, and they are here to help you guys on the journey today. And basically, like I said in the beginning, keep calm and keep coding. Yeah? Across all of these. Uh, so these are the exercises I believe uh, you all have ready on your computer. If any of you don't, uh, please please open it. Uh, make sure you cloned it. It's on your local machine. Local machine. That means computer. Does everyone have this? If anyone needs more time, please raise your hands. Okay. So we just take half a minute. Uh, give you a bit of space to digest my crazy monologue. Anyone needs help getting this repo onto your computer? Your friendly TAs are totally available, waiting to help. Anyone else needs help getting the exercises on? No? So if you need help, just raise your hand at any time and the TAs will approach you. Um, I'll, I'll just carry on here. So uh, before we begin, like the mindset, just to reiterate again, because I feel that that's the most important takeaway for today. Programming is a long journey. It's not a matter of you coming here to learn like one plus one equals two. Um, code is basically just telling the computer what to do. Very simple. Code is not some like mythical bunch of characters that you write on the computer and boom, something happens. It's basically just a language to tell your computer what to do. Uh, the purpose is that it does two broad things. One is that it does some work, for example, calculations, processing, all that stuff. And another is that it helps you to coordinate work, like saying, if, you're this, if this is happening, do that. If that is happening, do this, something like that. So two broad categories, the calculations and then achieve control flow. Uh, environment is just to state that programs, whatever you're running on your computer, it doesn't run uh, in thin air. It's running within your machine, the limitations of your machine, the setup of what you're using, and things like that. So sometimes if uh, code works on one machine and not on the other, that is the reason, because the environment is different. Okay? Uh, that's why it's important to note things like versioning and all that stuff, but you don't have to think about it today. Um, that's for your knowledge in the future. And I also want to state, like, I'm, I, I do JavaScript. I, I help to run the JavaScript meetups in Singapore. We have a meetup next Wednesday if anyone's interested. Uh, doesn't mean because I think it's the best language. It was just the most accessible one for what I want to do. There is no best language. Some people will defer. Um, just kindly smile and say, mm, I defer. Okay. 
So every language has its advantage and purpose. Uh, there are stuff that are better for hardware, like you're going more low level. And then there are uh, languages like JavaScript, which is great for interacting with your browser. It's, it's very easy to write. Um, you can keep it very light, very low template if you want, things like that. And then you have Python, which is easy for you to do calculations and all that data stuff. So every language was designed with a strong purpose for doing particular things. Sometimes you can do multiple things with it. Um, but yeah, so, so understand the language and the reason why it is. So don't forcibly try to do like uh, C++ on the internet. Like I, I do it at work, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah, uh, the different purpose, you know? So try and do animations with another language. It's like just making your life difficult. So go, go with the language that works for that purpose of what you're trying to achieve best, okay? Um, there is really one way, which for example, you can be like, oh, um, how do I, um, how do I add two strings together, like I said here? Uh, there are actually many ways to do it. So what we learned today, then you can go home and you'll be like, how do I combine strings together? And then the internet will show you another way. So this is just to let you know, there are multiple ways to do the same things. Because people have opinions, and the web is developed by people, and so things happen. So pick the way that suits you best, that you think is most efficient, that you're comfortable with, that you understand fully how it works, and just like run with it, you know? You don't have to learn like all 5,000 ways on how to loop through and away in different ways, front, back, forward, uh, low memory, whatever, you know? Just like pick the way that for you in the beginning when you're learning how to do it, learn it, use it, okay? And just acknowledge that there are other ways to do the same thing. People differ. If someone tells you this is better, you can try it out, but like go with the way that you, you feel is comfortable for you right now and then try to advance step by step. So like I said, little victories every time on programming. Um, master what you know, then carry on uh, with the next piece, and then the next piece, and the next piece. And finally, like I mentioned, community drives the development of all these uh, frameworks, the language, and everything. And even learning. Like if you, if you think of programming or computing as like someone sitting behind a computer all alone, that is massively different. It's actually a lot of people sitting behind the computers all alone. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what? My dictionary opened. Oxford English. Okay. So uh, finally, all my blibbit babbler, and now we can get started. Okay. So uh, open the open the repo. We call this kind of thing repository. A repository is like a library concept. You have like something. It's just it's just a a a, a meaningful thing. So this is called a repository, pre-bootcamp workshop 2019 on GitHub. GitHub is where a lot of developers host code. You can use it, you can do it on different other areas like GitLab and things like that as well. But this is just where a lot of code is hosted. Uh, you can even write things, this is called Markdown, which is a type of file. So you just write text. You know, it's like a TXT file, this is an MD file. Okay. So let's get started. So going to part one, uh, fonts bigger. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I like small fonts. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe uh, I will recommend simultaneously having this uh, GitHub uh, browser open as well as the slides. Uh, but you don't need to look at the slides. Uh, so having this, your VS Code editor open and um, slides if you like. The slides don't involve, doesn't really help you with your exercises. It's just for backfilling some knowledge afterwards. So really focus on, on this piece, okay, on the browser. So let's begin. Lesson one, how to print things on screen. Uh, so can you please all open your VS Code? I'll do it on the side here so I understand what you're doing. Um, as you already have learned last week, HTML, um, it's basically just the, the model of how your document is going to be like. So please do this. Raise your hands if you need help. Have you guys all gotten to this piece where you have this on your editor? Uh, who doesn't yet have this open on your editor? Uh, can the TAs go around to check the computers as well? Uh, not, 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 not to force you guys, but like, Following along would really help. 
So create a new project, um, call it my JavaScript, uh, and then create a brand new file uh, and paste this piece of code in. Just copy and paste it. Close it. <laughs> I need to close my time out and stuff. Open your Visual Studio Code Editor uh, and copy and paste it in. If your screen is not black with a bunch of colors on it, that means you're not doing it right. Yep. It should feel a bit familiar from last week. Everyone gets it? Cool, cool. I'm going to carry on. Raise your hands if you need help, um, if you can't find your editor, if you, you want to copy paste and stuff like that. But if you copy paste and there's no color on the document, uh, it's because you haven't saved it as the file type. So what is very ha helpful about editors is that it gives you colors uh, depending on what you're writing so that programmers can spot codes and mistakes in your code very quickly, very intuitively. You say the color of this is wrong, or then you kind of know like, oh, I forgot to close my tag, I forgot something. So name the file index.html, command save. I need to change this to my JavaScript. So then double click on this file, or I always copy path. I'm on Chrome, damn it. And you should see this. You will see this little line of lonely code saying, hello world. Uh, who has this on their screens? Awesome, awesome. If you don't and you need any help, please raise your hands. If it's not showing up, please raise your hands. If you can't find the file, you don't know what path to get to, please raise your hands. Okay. Uh, help is needed here. Switch. Mm -hmm. 
So essentially, a browser is just a way for you to read files. Whether the files come from the internet or from your machine, a browser is just for a way for, a way for you to read files. Okay? So. You can test out if you like. You can say like, hello, cats. You save it. You refresh it. Refreshing is just telling the browser to like reread the file. Uh, and then you see the update. The line is updated, and, and that's it. So if um, anyone is not, not there yet, please raise your hands. The TA will come and help you. I'll move on to exercise 1.2, which is Let's learn to customize, so not just write static strings. So we go back to Visual Studio Code. In the index.html file, let's change the JavaScript portion. So as you can see, this word, this tag's called script. Let's change this portion inside. Okay. So you have script. Copy and paste this portion in. Just delete this whole thing. Ah, oh, no. Are you so big? Safe. So delete the line from just now. There is one thing that I used to do, which is code hoarding. So when I'm doing exercise, I used to keep all the pieces of code, like they are precious little pieces of silver and gold, in my thing. That's not the right approach. Like, man, that will make your life so difficult. So if you want to, you can always go back to the exercise to copy and paste. So there's no need to like hold on to that piece of code that you did previously in the previous exercise. Delete that piece that says document right uh, and copy and paste this one in so your file ought to look kind of like mine so you click command save, command s which just uh, shorthand you'll find developers use a lot of uh, shortcuts I'm actually very I'm actually a bit inefficient about this because I don't use too many shortcuts, but you really should because you can do things very fast. It's, it's like using a computer. So command save, very basic. Uh, go back to the file and refresh. And you should see this prompt. It's called a prompt, like alert, you know. Do, do, do you all get this on your screens? Isn't this exciting? It's like interaction, yo. <laughs> So put your name in. So my name is Min. Type OK. And oh my god! Oh my god! My phone knows I'm Min! So I get, hello Min! Oh, I feel so personalized. Like, uh, this feels great. <laughs> you laugh, but actually kind of, this is how the process of your computer or your Gmail knowing, hi Rebecca, uh, hi Jia En, like, welcome back, you know? So you get to, get to have interactions, you get to input your name, your address and stuff when you're ordering food on Deliveroo uh, and you're putting in your address and your unit number and stuff like that. That, that is all interaction. So we should have that, except mine says Min, not Michael. <laughs> so this is just one way of, uh, so you might have a few I'd, like questions on what is a document, what is window, what is this thing called prompt. We will dis demystify all of that later. I, I know like these questions are there because when I begin, it's all on my mind. So the the this are just some ways of like them. Like I said, there are many ways of doing exactly the same thing. Uh, this is just one way of getting some information from the user. In the future, you could be using other ways to get that same pop-up effect. There's actually not a window prompt. This is actually just like a div where you type in the input. 
and, and it, that's the same behavior. So today, what we're working with, we are working with window.prompt. Okay? So on each of the exercises, there's a bit of uh, more information on MDN. It's my favorite website ever. Um, it's kind of like a love-hate relationship, but now I really, 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 really love MDN. Um, it's where you get more information on exactly what a, a particular um, thing does. I'll put it this way. So Windows.prom, what is this? You know? So M MDN is very in-detail information about it. So MDN is ex it's designed for both professionals and beginners and everything. So there are parts where they are a bit mind-boggling. Just skip them, go to the examples, OK? So when you go and refer to NDM, for example, you'll see something called syntax. Syntax is just a way to write something. So result equals Windows prompt message default. So when you see things inside brackets, you are basically just passing uh, uh, a variable. You, you, I'll demystify this later, OK? You're basically just getting input. And then it would tell you like what those parameters are, if you want to know, and what does this thing return you. So a Windows prompt will return you a string of what you input. Okay? And you have things like examples. But I will recommend getting comfortable with all of these first. And then when you are curious about a particular thing and what it does, then you start to go in there. Don't try to digest everything. Like even today, I don't try to digest everything because it's too much information. I go to the examples, I try them out, I get, I get the answers, and that's it. And at the most, I look at the syntax, so I know what to put inside a particular method. You call this functions methods. Uh, anyone not following? If so, if, if at any one point you, you feel like, oh, you're not following the exercise anymore, and you don't want to like, raise your hand in front of the class, just like raise, the TAs will come to you. I will not, I will not go over and terrify you. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we move on now to exercise 1.3. Let's do some clicking. Okay, so objectives. Uh, so if you look at the titles, they're actually kind of funny. I had a lot of sneakers. I didn't write that, Mike, Mike wrote that. Um, okay, so now we're going to learn how to do something like you learned last week, maybe writing how a button, right? A HTML button that will trigger JavaScript code. Ooh, very exciting. So let's go back to the Visual Studio Code. Index, inside your index.html, okay. uh, like I said again, don't code hard, just delete it. But if you want, you can create uh, multiple file names instead of just index.html. You can say lesson one point, uh, lesson one underscore two underscore index.html. So you can keep all that pieces if it makes you feel better. Uh, or, or like you just like to be able to go through them again later. But um, I recommend always not keeping old code. Okay. So let's copy and paste this piece um, that includes a H1 tag and a button. Command C. Write it in the body tag. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, delete this. Oh, should I delete the script? Yeah. yeah delete me. Yeah, I think it's not nothing to do with the thing. Yeah. Let's have a refresh. Are you guys ready to refresh? Boom! This is a headline. So notice just now we wrote a lot of things inside this thing called the script tag. Now we are going into the body tag. So the script is like JavaScript. It sits within the body of the HTML file. Um, but in the body, it can take a lot of stuff that is independent of the, the HTML scripts. So this is roughly what it should look like. I leave a lot of lines just to make sure it's very visible. Generally, when you are doing professional work, you try not to do this. Oh, it's up to you and your colleagues. Everyone has their own quirks. So you have this piece, and then you ought to see this on your browser. Do you get this is a headline? How many of you are here? OK, so that's most. How many of you need another minute? 
No? So if you don't know, just raise your hand, please. Um, the TAs took time off their Saturdays. They're here to help you. Uh, professional developers are very expensive per hour, so they're really like helping you out for free. <laughs> This is not the time to be shy. Okay, so add this beside the script tag. So save, go to the see button, and then when you click it, boom, the headline goes red. I I'm doing all of these exercises at the same time as all of you, so if anything goes wrong, then I'll have the same problem, okay? So, so this changed, okay? Because, um, so, okay, this is the concept of like, so in, in programming, you try to reuse a lot of things. So there are things that are very, very basic, um, like having a div, uh, which is like a container, uh, having a p tag, which is like uh, for you to write paragraphs of text. And then you have things like buttons, which is to get interaction. So uh, I'll, just be more, I'll just be a bit more explicit because I'm not sure if everyone, I think there were maybe one or two people who didn't come last week. Um, so that's a button. So on a button, there are a few, inherent methods that you can use that have that's inside the specifications of a button okay so like i said a lot of things are about specifications the language is a standard it's just like uh, english the grammar is a standard like a dictionary is a standard um, all those kind of things are standardized so there's a bunch of non-standard things you can do in the future when you know things better but in terms of um some common methods that a bit button needs to have. A button needs to be able to have an on-click function so that you can interact with it. So this method's name is on-click, all small. Please remember that in programming, like your casing is super important. The computer is extremely literal. If you think about it, that a computer doesn't generally try to understand what's going on. It does exactly what you tell you. A computer is like your servant. Uh, I'm sorry for using this concept, it's real medieval. <laughs> but yeah, so basically you have on click, you do something to tell the document, hey, find my element by this ID headline. And then you go look for the, H, um, the H1, not because I mentioned H1 here, but because it has the ID headline. Oh yeah, I'm so stupid, I could do that. I use the arrow, I'm <laughs> just like standing here like this. <laughs> yeah. So it has a headline called, um, an ID called headline. And note carefully that the casing is headline with a capital L. Okay, this is something called camel casing. So in different languages, there are different conventions on how you write multi-word uh, words. <laughs> um, so this is called camel casing because, you know, camel bumps, right? So the, the, after the first one, then the next ones are bumps. Whereas in CSS, for example, you tend to do uh, what you call kebab casing, which is like a text, a dash, a text, a dash. So there are different funny namings for this. You'll get multiple different names for the same thing. But this in JavaScript, we use camel casing. But generally, HTML, you don't write camel casing, but it's fine. Uh, so then on document, when you get an element, so each one of these is called an element, like uh, a button is an element, for example. And then there are a bunch of, like I mentioned, uh, meaningful properties that they have, like st on style, which is basically referring to its um, style. <laughs> That's a property called color, and you change it to red. Okay, so nowadays, like besides things for the designers that are here, there are other ways to specify colors, like RGBA, hex codes, and stuff. But the, um, it also inherently understands um, some common color names, so like red, uh, goldenrod, yellow, um, marine, things like this. So there are some colors, you just need to Google HTML, CSS, colors, and then you can use a bunch of default ones. So you change that to whatever color, when you click on that button, it will change into that color. If you want to experiment with hex codes, you can also put it in there. Hex codes is just uh, another way of specifying colors to greater specificity. And so just for fun, uh, pink. It turns pink. Yeah, so basically you're just telling the button to change the color of this element to pink. And color refers to text color. So that, that's what, what happens. 
So if you want to read into more details, again there is MDN um, over here, but I won't go into details. So click is something you definitely need to know uh, very well. Okay. So like I promised, I can't, I'll come back to demystify some things after the lesson. Oh, <laughs> what is present shortcut? I'll enter. Ah. Oh, this is weird. Oh, because I'm not signed in. Oh, I'm an idiot. So, uh, so I'm trying to be conscious of time. So what is Visual Studio Code? Visual Studio Code is just a way for you to write code. Uh, it, it is uh, created by Microsoft. It is very powerful. It allows you to work with different languages. Um, you can install things like extensions that help make writing code easier. You can change the color of how you want your code to be. Um, it doesn't affect what it finally comes out to. But while you're writing it, if you prefer a certain color scheme to help you spot things better, you can do that. Um, there are other options as well, which is Atom, which is more lightweight. A lot of people who write JavaScript only write that. And then you have something more full-featured called WebStorm. You don't need to go into that. It's expensive right now. Um, and it's mostly for like professionals. So it has a lot of other features that you could want to use. So just to let you know, like even something as simple as like writing your code, you have different tools you could potentially use. But stay with VS Code is a very good one. And a lot of people know it. Not because you're in Microsoft right now. <laughs> well, maybe also lah. Huh? I also use it lah. I use actually I actually use two or three. I actually use two code editors at work. Don't ask me why. Um, so document, what is document? Do you guys know? No. So uh, I think it, it, it's similar to the concept we have last week. So document basically is just a way for you to be able to assess your HTML's content. OK? Uh, so when you say document, there are some uh, inherent methods to find elements in this document by your ID. Uh, this is wrong. I'm so sorry. There shouldn't be a hash here, because ID already refers to hash. Uh, I wrote, so I just randomly wrote. Um, so then you can get something with an ID called pricing model. A model is just something that pops out on your screen. We call it models. Uh, so basically, when you write HTML, it's, so for some of you who already have some knowledge, I just wanted to make sure it covers a bit more range. Um, so your HTML will get passed, and then it will come into this, this model. And then you'll be able to uh, run through it, find the different pieces that you have written inside the HTML code. Yeah? Uh, and so uh, what is a window? So you saw just now window.prompt. So window is basically just the, the browser you're in right now. Not the browser, but just that specific tab. So it's a, like a particular, if you want to think about the environment that your file is in right now. Yeah. So it gives you access to a lot of global things, uh, like prompt. Okay. So prompt didn't come from your script. It came from your tab, the window.prompt. That's why you should be able, that's why you'll be like, how come I can write so many things that I never included inside my code? It's because a bunch of other people wrote it already and they've grouped it in a way that's meaningful to you. So like things like cookies, for example, Windows, you know, you use Windows.local storage to get uh, to store your cookies, get your cookies, things like that. So um, in every new tab, it's actually represented by its own Windows object. So if you're new, you don't need to understand this. You just need to kind of know the concepts that such uh, different kind of scopes, we start to call them scopes, exist. So moving on now to lesson two. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> so uh, you'll find the link here very conveniently included by Mike. So, um, do all of you have Chrome? So, we'll be opening something called the console. 
Okay. Um, so when you're on Chrome, for example, click View. Uh, uh, I always just type my shortcut. View. Develop. Oh, first Firefox. <laughs> developer. Uh, developer tools. No, no, JavaScript console. Uh, JavaScript console. Because I had it open already, so yeah. So uh, if any one of you prefer to type shortcuts, it's Command Option I. So do all of you have this thing on your Chrome browser called console open? If you need help opening it, please ask. It's a very strange area that normally people don't open to. But it's there in your Chrome. And you can actually go and open it on all websites because it's part of the browser, not the site. Just before you go to break or bring the cake for Max birthday. Okay. So uh you see any error by your exercise so it's fine, so we're right before break. Just that page the good thing about the error that it's not you're doing something wrong with page. So the rest of the exercise would not have to take a look. If you want to clear it, there's actually a pass sign. Let them go from break once the window the cake. You just click that and clear the errors, the errors for you. Try that. Right? So you should have a blank screen to start with. So when you open the console, naturally it's actually kind of small below the page. Just like drag it up so you have a big screen. Okay? Uh, anyone that's not here yet? Actually, all of you are not here yet because physically I'm the only one here. <laughs> okay, so let's begin. So, like I mentioned, in JavaScript there are different types of data types. Okay, so data types is just a meaningful grouping. It's saying things like, uh, uh, so this is not in code, but in real life you have things like numbers, you have alphabets. Uh, that same concept goes into JavaScript, for example, or other programming languages like numbers and strings or characters even. But in JavaScript, we just use strings. Um, so there are some mentioned over here, like Boolean. Boolean sounds very fancy, but it basically just means true or false. It's one of my favorite words because it rolls off the tongue very funnily, Boolean. Um, so integer is basically just a number. Float is another number uh, concept you will see, uh, which basically means decimal point numbers. Um, you will see this kind of distinction more in other programming languages or in CS basics, but in JavaScript, we just deal with it as numbers. Uh, yeah. So things like doubles is basically just also a type of, uh, just, uh, just decimal point numbers. Uh, and these are called primitives, because when you think of the English word primitives, you think of cave people, for example. If you say something is very primitive, it means it's very basic, it goes back to the roots. That's what primitive means. Primitive is something is that is not an object, um, and it has no methods, I think. OK, so don't get confused over here. Because th this is a primitive type, but in JavaScript, they will give you some methods and, and, and meaningful things um, a as a global thing called number. But that's not the actual concept of number, OK? Uh, just to make your life easier. So type in the console the word true, which is a Boolean. True is true. Mind blown. True, well, <laughs> I, I won't confuse you now, but it's quite funny. Okay. And then there's only false. False is false. Oh, goodness. So if you want to have some fun later of why this is an important thing, it's because when you're trying to evaluate something, like you say, um, like you're trying to say person, uh, a person is tall, um, is man, is funny. Then you do an evaluation. Is this a good um, boyfriend candidate? Is tall, is man, is funny, if you like men. So that's how the evaluation happens. And then when you do, if you want a combination of all those criteria, you do something called and. 
So it's tall, true, it's funny. I just got engaged, so I'm really happy. Uh, <laughs> so it's like this. So then you have and. So it evaluates to be all true. So that's true. But if one of them, the last one, uh, is funny, fails. Whoa! True, true, false. There's two truths and one false, but it becomes false. You know? It's because it fails all criteria. So I won't go into details into this today, but you'll start to see these kind of concepts of and or or. Okay? When you're doing, um, uh, when you're writing code in all languages. So that is the concept of Boolean and how useful it can be. Because you can do true or false. That's double pipe. And you get true because it will be like, uh, if your criteria for a partner is just is funny or is tall, um, if it just matches one of them, you get back, okay, that works. Sorry for senior analogies. <laughs> okay, so that is the concept of Boolean, true and false. Are there any other types for Booleans? No? Awesome. So uh, now we talk about numbers. So if you want to clear the console, you can press Command K. Shortcut. Love this. Windows? Huh? Oh, Windows, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a Mac user <laughs> forever. Control K, in fact, Control K. Oh, control. Oh, sorry, control. Yeah. So on Mac, command K. On Windows, control K. I, I, I thought it's a trickier question. <laughs> Does it work? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So we have um, numbers. Okay. So type numbers. Nine nine nine. That's a number. It comes back numbers. Uh, 10.9, that's also a number. Um, if you want to see what something is, you type type of 10.9. Uh, you get back, the, the console will tell you that is a number in different voices, depending on your mood. So, for example, if you type, oh, have you tried type of boo? But it's a function. So, if you want to figure out what type a particular thing is, you type type of space, that thing. And then it would tell you what type it is. It's boolean. There's something called big int. Um, you don't have to know it right now. It's because of the precision problem in calculating number um, in computing. Uh, it's just for very very big integers. So unless you're doing it like money in the bank and you don't want money to go missing or have too much money, that's not true. Um, then you do with such things. Otherwise, normally as a web developer, I don't deal with big int because I don't work for banks. If any of you work for banks, that was not a dis. I love banks. Um, so now we're number three. Have you guys all tried type of 999? It's a number. Okay. So next, moving on to the next concept. So the first time we talk about Boolean, second we talk about numbers, now we talk about strings. A string is just like a meaningful collection of characters, alphabets, you know? Uh, so a string can be consisted of just one letter, it can be consisted of five million letters. That's a very big string. Uh, yeah. So here's a string. Oh, you must put them into um, quotes. Hello world. That's a string. So string is a primitive. But in JavaScript, there are some methods that they added to it so that you can, so it instantly knows, all right, if you write something in double quotes, this is a string, and I'm going to attach a bunch of very helpful methods for you. A method is just a way of doing something, okay? So you would see things like two uppercase, right? So if you're like super excited about tech ladies, but then you get the word like this, and you're like, I want to make this uppercase. So you type two uppercase. And then you do the open parenthesis, a bracket is called parenthesis, close parenthesis is basically just to execute the method. Okay, so normally you have a bunch of like uh, methods, properties that are dot something like this, but when it's a function, which is a method, you do this to execute it. Not execute it, but execute it. So I'll do this. Boom, and the string becomes uh, all capitals. So right now, we're looking in isolation how to manipulate this kind of different data types. So try it, and then you'll be able to 
apply this concept as you go along. So all of this is not going to be kept by, this, by the file. It's not going to go anywhere. It only persists as long as your window is open, and when you close it, it's gone. But that's fine. Just open it again, do whatever you want, and then close it, you know. And then you can do other fun things, like repeat. Uh, but for repeat, let me use the emoji Wikipedia. Yeah, that's my file. So again, you want to clear, you type command K or control K for a Windows user. Emojis are now supported as strings. <laughs> In strings. Uh, and you can type repeat. And then boom, I get a whole row of emojis. And you can put cats, whatever you want. Or you can just write normal text, yeah? Do the ha. For space. Remember that if you put space, that space is inside the string too, okay? So that will count as the length of the string. So this is one method, for example, to tell like, oh, how long is this word? Dot length. Um, so there are a lot of very meaningful things that you can do with this kind of uh, inbuilt methods. So repeat 100 times. <laughs> you know, like, I want to laugh, but I'm too lazy. Can you edit? Can you edit one string that you already, or like, one you can, command that you... But that's an interesting thing, because we'll touch that later. So, right now, this is just like sitting on the console. But if you want a way to get back this information, you assign a variable name to it. So you can always reference it. So let me try that. So I'll write, variable laugh equals to ha. Right, it doesn't matter undefined. The second line is just because what? It's returning and it returns nothing. Just ignore that concept. For those that know, then you would know. Um, and you can type laugh. The console already knows that laugh refers to that string. So you can always call it laugh. Because imagine if you're dealing with a whole uh, a piece of text, right? A huge one. You don't want to type the whole thing over and over again. So computing is about being able to do things more efficiently, refer back to it and do it. So we can type laugh dot repeat. And then you get the string. Ha 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 ha. So you can do all sorts of things with the with a variable so you can get it back again. But if you want to get this string which returns, you'll be like long laugh. So it, it, it's fine to be a bit lost right now. Oh, forgot the number. Oh no. Oh no, the context. Um. Let's sing Basically, for instance, if you want to refer back to something, uh, you'll start to see in the exercises later. I'm jumping ahead of the gun, but it's fine. So let sing equals to la with a space. Uh, let song equals to sing repeat 10 times. So you repeat the same string 10 times. And then when you type the variable named song, you'll get the whole thing. La 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 la. Yeah? So basically, you see the word undefined is because that particular line of command doesn't really return a code. It just does something for you, which it basically does is it takes la, repeat it 10 times, and do something called assigning it to song, the variable name song. Okay? So variable is a very abstract thing. It's just like uh, saying this is a bucket called song. I put whatever I want into it. Okay? So now you have the word strings. So... If you do a really long one as well, you can do things like repeat. So play around with it when you get home. Um, so instead of quick brown fox jumps in, uh, over the lazy dog, you replace the word dog with monkey. So the quick brown fox jumps over the 
lazy monkey. So this is the method called replace for strings. So again, like if you go into MDN strings, You'll see on the side like a whole bunch of things that you can do to lowercase. You can find the one replace here, for example. Then you click replace. And this is the example. Okay? So I need to move on. So if you click this link, that's what you'll get. The MDN documentation. Okay. Numbers with decimals are basically just called floats. Um, it, but in JavaScript, we just call it all numbers, yeah? But in other concepts, other languages, you might hear things like floats and uh, things like that. And then there's another primitive called now, which is basically just now. Now just means now. It means it doesn't now. I don't know how you want to say now, but now means it doesn't exist. It's just like the void, you know? It's nothing. What's a better concept for now? Now now basically means false, but it's not a false. Does that make sense? <laughs> like a false is an actual answer. A false is saying it's true, it's false. Now is just like, almost like not applicable. Now it just doesn't exist. It's just a primitive type, okay? It'll come in useful next time. And you actually see a lot of behavior for the terms now. Um, you see things like undefined, it's also a type. Undefined just means it's not defined. If, for example, when you're writing a variable um, like this, it returns undefined because you didn't define what it should be. Right? So normally what you do is you say, height uh, goes to 160, and then it returns 160. So undefined is just a type of data. Okay, they just said it hasn't been defined yet. So now, moving on to exercise 2.2. Uh, I'm talking too long for each topic, so I need to go a bit faster. If you if you are lost or anything, just raise your hand, please, and the TAs will come and help you. Okay. So there's um, other types of, of data uh, that is interesting, that is not just... Uh, uh, primitive, like I said earlier, a primitive is a very basic kind of information. We have other things called an object. So in JavaScript, you either have primitives or you have objects. And objects can be a whole bunch of things. Uh, an array is an object, all sorts of things are objects. Okay? Uh, so you don't need to know this in too much into details. If people make jokes about how in JavaScript everything is an object, that's pretty much why, because it distills down to an object. Uh, object is basically, if you want to think about it syn syntaxly speaking, syntax just means uh, the way it's written. It's basically just these two things we call curly braces. Uh, they look like the moustache, but it's just curly braces. Okay, um, so we're going to this one called object. So in your console, please press command K or control K to clear it out. Like I said, don't hang on to old code. Throw it all away. Get new ones. So we type this. Remember we had uh, the type of just now? If you want to be sure you're typing an object, object. Ooh, it says object. So let's copy and paste this into the console. This is an object. And in the console, it is actually very helpful because it helps you to be able to interpret and, 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 and to see what you're dealing with easier. So you can just press down. It has made it very neat for you already. So you can easily see uh, what is an object's um, uh, property and the value or key. An object is typically what you call like a key value pair. So a key is just something that is like a abstract information, like your name is a key, your ID can be a key, stuff like that. And then what you actually assign inside is the value. Okay. So that is an object. It's a meaningful grouping of information or purpose or functions. So it's something that you start to compose, so make your life easier. 
And then, like I mentioned, I'm going to clear. Um, like what I was talking about, something called variables. Again, variables are just a way to have and hold on to a reference to something. Okay? So you can always hold on to a reference. Like for example, the word Mike is also a reference. It's a reference to this entity, human being, here called Mike. Is this too abstract? <laughs> but, but it's correct. So your name is a reference to refer to you. A name is not you. If I change my name to Rose tomorrow, I'm still me myself. I just have a different reference. Okay? And, and what is interesting about reference is that it's a shared reference. So a lot of things are shared, like concepts. So a number is shared. The idea of a name is also a shared thing. So think about it like that. So, yep. so that's what a, a variable is. A variable is a reference to something that can change. But it's a fixed reference to something that will change. So you don't need to keep tracking the thing that is changing. You just remember the variable's name. Makes your life really easy, okay? This is fundamentally probably the most important thing to me. Variables, functions. So let's try this out. Copy and paste this into your console. By typing the word var, you're trying to declare that I'm saying that I'm creating a variable called user. And I would tell this ver user to be this object. So copy and paste it. Like, because when you type it, I mean, you can type it as well for practice. Because actually, um, as you go along, you start to actually remember all the syntax of everything you're writing. You don't have to copy and paste so much. But in the beginning, it's fine to copy and paste to get it to work first, then to fiddle around with it, change the name if you like, change the email if you like, put your own name in it, stuff like that. So that in the future, when we try to get the word users, this is the fun part now. So in objects, when you type uh, a dot, this allows you to access the property. So of that term, that variable called user. So if I type user, it already knows that user has the, the property email and name. Isn't that convenient? It's extremely convenient. You won't always get this like on your IDE, for example. Not always you have this kind of stuff. Um, but on a console, it, it just it's helpful. It knows. So if, if you say, I want to retrieve the user's email, you do this thing called uh, dot, okay? Access the property. And then you get the value which was assigned to the email. So if you change the value of the email, you'll get the new one too. So there are two ways in general to assess the property of an object. One is through this dot and the other is through square brackets. So I can type in. This also gets you the thing. But remember that email here needs to be a string, so you put it in the quote. A double quotation will also work. But if you write user without this thing, it will think, what is this other reference? It doesn't exist. So in an object, those, you reference it like this in the object. Okay? So two, like I said, there are many ways to do the same thing. This is just two ways of getting the, the values inside an object. You can do a dot, or you can do a square bracket with a string inside of the property's name, the key. So if you want further reading, uh, we have this, okay? So, are you still with me? Anyone confused? Because I'm sure as hell confused. No? Everyone gets it? Okay, that's good. That's really good news. So this is the last part before we go on to um, <coughs> number three. So a lesson two of data types, another very, very important one, there are so many types, okay? Um, there, I will cover it later. Data types, data structures. So two very important things you need to know when you're trying to program for the front end, uh, objects and arrays. An array is basically just like a meaningful collection of things. It's like, uh, this is a bucket and it collects stuff. And you can put all sorts of things in it. In JavaScript, we are very type loose. So in the same bucket, for example, I can put numbers, I can put strings, I can put objects, I can put whatever I want. In some other languages, for instance, you will need to only be able to put strings inside an array or list, only be able to put numbers uh, inside an array or list. But in JavaScript, it's very, very flexible. 
that creates a, um, a bit too much flexibility sometimes. But when you know how to use it and, 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 and play and run with it, it's, it's very powerful. So this is what, what we call an array. Okay? An array is essentially two square brackets and stuff in it, a collection of things in it. So it's like, um, I like to think of objects, for example. An object is like a library book. It has a name, which is uh, JavaScript 101. And uh, an array is basically a bunch of those books. You know? So inside an array, you have uh, different book titles. So it's like a shelf for you where you put all the books you want inside. That's essentially what it is, just a linear shelf. So copy and paste this into the console. And very conveniently, the console even told you like, hey man, this array is seven uh, strings long, or seven stuff long. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh huh, that's correct. Uh, there will be some confusion later when you deal with the word, the term index. But that's not an index, this is just length, okay? So you can, you can, like I mentioned, in JavaScript, it's very flexible. So you can put like whatever you want inside. And then you can do this thing called push, for example. So um, you take a, an array of numbers and you push five into it. No, wait. Array. And then when you get new array, oh no, it gives me my length, okay. Um, that's because the array method push returns length, but actually your new array has these five things in it. Okay? Oh no, I forgot how to access. Uh, I'm getting mental freeze. How do I show the array <laughs> after push? You, you can array first thing you do. Ah, okay. Let try again. Array. Oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna eat it. Hi, <sighs> sorry. I remember I don't do this. Okay. So you get the try again array. You do a push. And then try again array. And then you grab it again and you'll see that there are five things inside. Okay? So that's where a bit of confusion happens because sometimes the method doesn't return you uh, the thing you're trying to create. Sometimes the method will return you a string. So you need to know um, what something does. So a push actually can do, a push at the same time, it adds in something for you. But when you want to grab the value of it, you might get something else. Okay? So it can, two things can happen at the same time. So for those that have already written some JavaScript or jQuery, Sometimes some kind of confusion comes in there, exactly like what I was doing just now. Okay, okay conscious of time. <coughs> so let's do a recap. So the data type. You might have, have anyone heard of the terms data type? Hey, all of you should have heard of it, yo. Because <laughs> you're like sitting here in this room and I'm going data type, data type, data type, data type. There's also something called data structure, which is something a bit more abstract, okay? So for data types, which is basically like we men I mentioned, um, a class of information and they share a certain kind of um, similarities, like numbers, you know, they're all very similar, strings, they're all strings, stuff like that. And then there is something called data structure, which you don't need to know. This is a CS concept. Uh, it's an abstract way of organizing a data to do something more efficiently. So you hear things like uh, an array, which is the one you need to know. And then you hear other types of data structures like linked list, graphs, stuff like that. It's just a way to make computing more efficient. So if you want to assess, for, for example, if you need to write if you need to write a piece of information faster than you need to be able to assess it, you use a certain type of data type. If you want to be able to find information faster, you organize the information in a different data structure. Okay? Don't need to know this. In the future, when you hear it as you go along, then you just kind of know that it's just a, uh, an organization of information to do something easier. So different operations, you have different type of data structures. 
But for JavaScript, all you need to know is the data types and arrays and objects. Oh. So in JavaScript, there are um, seven primitives and something called an object. A primitive, like I mentioned again, is basically just something very basic. You have something called Boolean, true, false. You have now, which is now, just no. Uh, you have something undefined, which is actually also a type. Numbers and strings. And these two are pretty new in modern JavaScript. You don't need to know about it. Um, you, you most likely wouldn't use it. And most of you end up using symbol. If you work with big numbers, you work with big int. But just remember, this five is good enough. Uh, and then the idea of objects. Okay, so in JavaScript, an array, for example, is also an object. Um, that's a story for another time. Uh, yeah. So, like we have run through a little bit already, how to work with uh, uh, data types in JavaScript. JavaScript has very conveniently added a lot of methods and properties to make your life easier when dealing with it. So, for example, if I want to add two strings together, I can do that. Uh, if I want to change things to lowercase, I can make all uppercase or lowercase. Uh, if I want to do with numbers, I have ways of doing that. So, let, var, cons are just all ways of declaring variables. It's just three different ways of declaring variables. Same, not the same thing, but almost the same thing. If you are not sure, use var. If you want the value to change, use let. If you want the values to never change, use const. Okay, it's just just just, just a simple rule. And then you can even ask if uh, if new height is a number or not. So is nan is is not a number. That's that's another kind of method that you common, commonly see. Sometimes you're typing something and you ask, is it a number? It will say nan, not a number. Numbers to string. Because 500 is not the same as that 500. It looks like 500 to you, but those two things are different. This is a number, and this is a string, because it comes in quotes. And so they have very different methods that come with them, very different ways of treating them. Sometimes you need to uh, send a number as a string, so you'll convert it to a string before you send it over the internet. So, yeah. So the most useful thing that you can uh, take away today is that there are objects and then there are arrays. So like I mentioned, the library concept. So you can let a book equals to title cats page 509 page. So that's a meaningful description of what a book is. And then in a library, you have an array of different uh, titles. So it's just a way for you to collect different stuff in a meaningful way that makes sense to you. So a library is a term that makes sense to you. A library is a collection of books. So I have a collection of each one of these are books. Okay, I can even take this reference here, this variable name, and put it inside here. And you would know to this is a collection of books that includes this title called cats. Okay, so object is uh, something that describes one thing, and uh, array is a collection of something. And like I said. So for those who are further along uh, in learning jQuery, JavaScript, and stuff like that, there are, there are a lot of methods that are attached to this concept. So if this is new to you, it's, it's, fi it's fine to not understand what I'm talking about. Okay, Perfectly normal. So there are a lot of uh, very helpful things that you can use in JavaScript, um, like to freeze an object, which means you can't change anything of it, to assign it, which means to combine them together, so basically, object dot assign assigns this little object here these two values, the values that are inside, stuff like that. Okay, and then to type object dot keys for x, you just grab all the keys for the object. Okay, so it's for those of you that have already tried out JavaScript and understand the concept of objects and stuff, there are a lot of methods that in JavaScript that are new or not so new that you can use to make your life easier when dealing with them. Okay? Because code is all about efficiency. Not all about efficiency, but fun too. Um, and then for arrays, also you have a whole bunch of helpful methods, uh, like the one we tried just now, push, which is uh, basically adding something to the end of the array. Uh, and then you can also do something called looping through an array, which means to uh, take a library, for example, and start to look from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, to find something. Like I say, I go through a library, I go sequentially to look through it, I go from the first book uh, to find the title cats. So I search, 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 search. That is what you do when you're doing things like for each or, or for each. Okay. 
Uh, map is to do the same thing, but to, for example, if you want to do that, and then return a new array which changed something. Okay, so, so there are, um, there are all sorts of things you can do with data and information, and there are subtleties as to the different methods and what is more efficient or makes more sense to be using. A lot of times you can use different methods to do the same thing, but the methods were each designed to do a particular thing better. Um, so that is the distinction that comes along when you are more familiar with <coughs> the language in general. Not, not just in terms of syntax and stuff, but in terms of the concept of exactly what you want to do. There are more efficient ways of doing it if you like. Uh, and then on all very basic things like on object and <coughs> array, you have things like uh, checking its length, how many books are there inside your library, uh, is array, checking whether or not x is an array, okay, things like that. That is helpful when you're trying to, to deal with uh, things that you didn't declare, for example, like maybe the server sends you back something, you want to check is this an array, and you do things like array check is array library. You know. So for those of, those of you that want to go into more information, MDN, uh, Global Objects Array, then you see more methods, all the things that you can do with it. Okay. So we're almost at break time already, so hang with me for a little more. We're moving on to lesson three. <coughs> I don't know why when I'm talking, I get game show host voice. <laughs> I, I, I cannot help it, even at work I do this. <laughs> I'm a bundle of fun at work. <coughs> okay, so uh, is anyone not clear about the whole idea of data types? There are some, there are basically primitives and objects in JavaScript. Um, data types that are important for you to remember is the number, string, undefined, now, boolean. And then for objects, remember the idea of an object and array. Okay, these are already really powerful for you. So. Let's go back to code. Oh, my game show voice. <sighs> God. <laughs> okay. So, uh, like we've already previewed earlier because of your question of the idea of what variables are. So, hopefully, this lesson will be a bit clearer. So, uh, some jokes that Mike put in, let there be variables because you can use the word let to say let variables. I saw all his titles, I was like, oh my god, every one of them is terrible! But also really good at the same time. <laughs> oh, shame! I was really funny, I kept laughing. Um, so, so the objective is basically just to learn how we can deal with uh, data very efficiently um, and to be able to always keep like a reference to them. Okay, there's the concept of mutable and immutable. Mutable means that it can like mutate, you know, like X-Men, you know, mutate, stuff like that. And then it's immutable, I'm immutable, and sadly, uh, yeah. yeah, no superpowers. Uh, yeah, so where somebody else can mutate, you know. So some variables should not be able to change. Like I mentioned earlier when you use the word const, it refers to constant. So a constant, um, Multiplier, for example, is two times. Okay, so like a, a constant interest rate is a fixed one if you want to do that. So you keep the words constant. So this, these things should not change. So basically, like we mentioned, variable is just a container of data uh, that you put into it. You assigned it and you want to call it this name. You want to call this. So basically what happens is like um, when you're working with things, you give it uh, abstract concepts, like I mentioned, Mike is an abstraction of a person, not to be too philosophical. Uh, yeah. So let's see what else there is. Yes. So a variable name, please don't have any space. That's why there was camel casing, like I mentioned earlier, to be able to differentiate, to remember between um, a multi-word variable, uh, to read it easier. That's why you do camel casing. But do not leave space. If you leave space, the computer interpret that as variable name ended. Okay. So how you're writing, the importance of spacing, syntax, and all that kind of semicolon things, it's just a way to, for the computer to understand you better. A computer is like a very simplistic, well, not, not nowadays, but essentially at its root, it understands things in a very fixed way. It's like a very stubborn machine. You got, just got to work with it, okay? Uh, so let's try this in the console. We have already tried it, so I'm going to go a bit faster. So we have variable name. <coughs> so 
when you do that, you're actually declaring the existence of this variable. You're just saying, hey computer, there's a variable called name and it's coming soon. I don't know what is inside right now, but something will be in it later. So the computer will keep somewhere in its little thing called memory, this name variable. And you can also try, oh uh, no, I can't. It's, just, it's the same thing. Is that gonna work? Yeah. So, huh? I don't know why. You can re declare maybe. Um, so, variable name, you can try Elisha Tan. That means your variable's name is name. <laughs> your variable's name is name. And the value inside is Elisha Tan. Elisha Tan was the one that walked in out. She organizes this, started this. You see her again. So there are some concepts you're going to hear, like uh, declare, initialize. Uh, in the future, you'll hear instantiate. Uh, you'll hear assign, stuff like that. They all sound like the same thing. Essentially, they do all <laughs> like they sound like the same thing. But because uh, computing people like to be very specific, so particular things have very specific names to it. Just, just know that there are different kind of actions essentially, but you know, life goes on. You can know about this one year later. Okay, so uh, basically, when you when you write uh, when you declare a, a variable name and you give it a value at the same time, you are initializing it. If I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, so then you can also freeze it. The, so if you don't want name to change, because Elisha loves her name. So const name and that name will never you cannot change it anymore. So let's let's try that. Okay. So if I want to redefine this name, I want to give it a new value, I'll be like changing name to min. Boom! You can't do that because it's a const. Because you have declared to say it is to say computer please protect this variable for me it's a constant and it will never change so it will stop you from your own mistakes okay so that's why it's meaningful to be able to have these words called const and let because let tells the computer uh, you are going to change whatever value it is and then when you declare a variable you say const that means the computer will protect you from yourself to say all right you can't change this mean what you're trying to do Whereas var you can change. So var was the original version and const and let came in later as the language evolved. So I like to see uh, variables as containers. Mm -hmm. So I think of it as a, as a treasure chest. So in a let variable means you can still put things in the treasure chest or change things inside the treasure chest, right? So whereas if it's a constant, const means you already put stuff in the treasure chest and you don't let it, you lock it up. Means you cannot change it anymore. Right, so that, that is what would be like immutable, cannot be mutated or can be changed. Right, so you find that if you use let on the same uh, variable name twice, you actually throw an error, so you already you have already declared that variable. So you kind of, you cannot redeclare the same variable name, right? But you can override the data that's inside that. Right, so you can try now let name something. They try it again using the word let name something. You should throw an error. Right, so you should try now. Yeah. Because you've already declared it somewhere, you've created a container somewhere, and telling you, hey, you already created a container, so don't try to re re recreate it. It's already there. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there is no use to have a reference if it can refer to all sorts of different things at the same time. Okay, it, It's a meaningful abstraction to refer to something that you understand the entity of. I'm sorry to say it like this. Person, Mike. Okay, so we're almost at the end. Uh, for those of you whose bladders are bursting, mine is, so I'm going to try to be fast. Uh, so, basically the concept of variable is for you to be able to deal with data meaningfully, pass it around, change it, pass it around some more, and stuff like that. So a variable is just a reference to store information, okay? So like you said, treasure chest, put information in it. My treasure chest name is gold treasure chest. That's my variable's name. So you can assign all sorts of different types of data inside it. In JavaScript, you don't have to declare the type before. For those of you who have some background, 
you don't have to declare the type, a variable can allow you to take any kind of data types. Whereas for other languages, for example, you kind of need to say, this variable can only store this type of information, uh, can only store numbers. So then you cannot store any other types or the computer will warn you, hey, what are you trying to do? Okay? So in JavaScript, there's a level of flexibility in writing these kind of things. Um, so there's the concept of declaring, like we mentioned earlier. So when you, when you first introduce the idea of this variable to the computer, sorry, I keep saying computer, I just say it very simplistically. Um, you're basically declaring, hey, name as a variable exists. Okay? When you initialize it, it means that you are declaring and also assigning a value to it at the same time initially. That's why it's called initialization. So they sound like big words, but actually, if you look into it, most of the time, they kind of make sense. So declaring is like saying, hey, name. And then initializing is like, uh, hey, name equals cat. That means I give you an initial value in the beginning. And then you have the other term called assigning, which means to give it a value. Okay, It can be when you're initializing, you're actually assigning a, a value to that variable. Or later on, you can reassign a value to the variable. Name can change to min. If you do a let name, it can change to min, Elisha, Mike, uh, Sujin, anyone. Okay? So basically, there are three keywords when dealing with variables. The most traditional one is var. This is the most supported since, the, since a long, long, long time. And these two came along with ES5 or 6, I can't remember. Um, so later, you understand the concept of ES, which is ECMAScript. It's basically just a standardization of JavaScript that adds more and more features every year by a group of people called ECMA International. So these things are kind of new, so, um, but nowadays uh, these two are fully supported. So there is a symbiotic relationship between all this stuff as well as the uh, browsers, uh, uh, things like that. So sometimes some features were created in a particular version of the JavaScript already. Um, but the browsers don't support it yet. That's why sometimes you'll see, oh, this particular type of writing doesn't work in the browser yet. But these ones do. And later there'll be a website I'll introduce called Can I Use, in case you want to check and try more newer things. But for now, I recommend just stick sticking to uh, either var or let cons, like that's it. I think there's only three ways to assign. <laughs> to declare. Okay, uh, so now we're going into our break time. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut the break time a little bit, right? Because uh, let me look at the. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, now it's break time. Okay. So. So I'm going to start. Uh, doors are not closed. Uh, <laughs> if anybody walks past, like oh god. Oh, this is one of my favorite jumpers. Okay, it's a Pixar jumper. Uh, so now going on to lesson four, I uh, hope that bit of food and, and toilet break had, uh, well in the end we still had 30 minutes, so I broke my own like, oh come back in 15 minutes, <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Um, so, so I hope you had time to let that marinate in your head about variables, data types, uh, that fun something called functions and stuff like that. Uh, so this will be the more hands-on part of part one, where you'll get to fiddle around, don't have to listen to me tell very lame jokes to myself all day. Um, so, we <laughs> I didn't write this title, my wrote it. So, adding artificial intelligence. So, you know, to use the word very loosely is essentially like guiding stuff to happen, okay? Uh, so, it's basically about controlling the flow of things. So abstract, my god. Okay. So let's see what it says. So uh, the hands-on part now, please create a new file and name it lesson4.html. This <coughs> Lesson4. <coughs> so rightfully, you should have saved each of the lessons if you wanted to save them as lesson1, 2, 3, 4. And then copy this extremely long piece of text. Copy, paste. <coughs> Click uh, Control S or Command S to save. 
I'm very fresh. Oh, long fell. <laughs> so. Eh? Oh, no space. <coughs> so you should essentially see this, yeah? So again, open up lesson four, copy paste this piece of code. Um, it's actually a complete piece of page. Uh, into your um, your VS code, control save, open that file directory in uh, your browser and you should see something like this. Anyone a little blocked and need some help? Feel free to get help from your TAs. They have uh, eaten some food and drank water or tea and coffee. Put them to work. <laughs> kidding, kidding. So what is going to happen here is that I'm going to go through a bit of, uh, everyone's ready? So I guess most people are ready because can use phone and click click already, so must be okay lah, huh? Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to go through this piece of uh, code, if you're going to call it a piece, it's actually a, a full thing. Uh, a little bit, explain what the different pieces are, uh, link them back to what I've mentioned earlier in the lessons 1 to 3, and then let you off into the wild to play with it. Okay, and then we will carry on. I'll come back and explain more information. So let's let's review this in completion. My says I talk too long, so I need to let you guys try. Okay. So uh, this is this. <laughs> I'm kidding. So this is a HTML file. Remember that. Uh, there's like just to go back in the recap. There's things called the header, like from last week, and there's the body. Body is where all these things you want to render on the page will start to go into. Inside body, there is something called a script tag where you can put in JavaScript. In body, you can put in the other HTML kind of elements. So let's look into the script area. So, uh, starting from the top, you'll see, so sometimes you want to write stuff inside the code to tell your colleagues stuff or to remind yourself that well, <laughs> of what this thing does. Uh, in the beginning, I wrote so much comments. There was something very funny, a colleague was coaching a, a brand new fresh grad uh, two weeks back. He said this and I can't forget it. He's like, he's, so he's very senior, he's like, I want to see more code than comments in your code. <laughs> <laughs> that reminded me in the beginning, oh god, I wrote so much comments, as much comments as my code. So basically, one thing is when you start to code, uh, as you go along and you build a bit more, uh, um, you get a better feeling of things. You should be able to name things in ways that read very naturally. So code is not meant to be awkward or like very strange terms and stuff like that. Actually, if you name your methods properly, like um, get data from um, names, uh, get data from like name backend, something like that. That, that is a bit like a mouthful, um, but it's very clear what it's trying to do and when you start to code professionally you need to remember you're not the only one touching the code base you have colleagues as well and some of them have more violent tendencies so you need to make sure that it's very easily legible not just to your colleagues but also to yourself one month six months one year later okay you come back you can see it so when you write your code to be something very uh, clear and not just method one method two variable 1, variable 2, variable 1, 2, 3, 4, like that. Uh, you should be able to come back, read it, and it will read like something that makes sense to you. So for the pieces that you really cannot, sometimes we start to write things like comments to communicate uh, the information or additional pieces of information that doesn't go into the code. Uh, those are what you see here. So this is like a single line way to comment. So when you type a double slash in front of something, the, the interpreter will know <laughs> Was that a better word? Uh, I'll just say the computer will know not to ignore this piece, this line of code. Uh, and then when you want like a multi line, you can write slash star slash star. Okay, so this is why I did this. So basically, remember we're talking about initialization, which is when you declare the variable and also assign it a value at the same time. This is what is happening. 
Sometimes when you see code, you start to see things like semicolons behind to terminate the line. Uh, in JavaScript nowadays, the because of Python influence, I think people stop writing semicolons. I'm still a big semicolon writer. Um, because they feel like it's cleaner, so you actually don't have to, because they don't know to include the semicolons for you behind. But traditionally, uh, you try to write things very explicit, and that's what you write. If you, especially if you don't write things in clear lines. Uh, if you try to write them all into one line without any breaks, you need the semicolons. So uh, this line says, let uh, my to-do, basically it's saying, hey, this is my to-do list. Uh, it's an array. And then when you see that it's an array, you know, oh, okay, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's going to go in there. This is the good kind of data structure to use. Okay, um, And then remember, with array, there are some methods called push, which is to add the thing into the list uh, in sequence. So when you push, what happens? When you write code like this to say, this uh, four lines of push, what will happen is it will evaluate from top to bottom in this particular case to say, hey, uh, add to the array, um, uh, get the task, get oolong tea, second, buy more cat feed, third, pet the cat before leaving the house today. My cat gets very anxious if I don't. Um, and then fourth, uh, attend the tech ladies pre boot camp workshop too, which is why you're here, so that's on your to do list. Uh, so that's what, that's what happens when you're adding things to an array. Then we go to line 34, which basically just means, hey, um, look through the HTML that I've written to look for an element that has the ID my list, which you'll see here. So these are the HTML um, tags that you've written and things like that. You assign this particular list. UL is called an unordered list. Um, so basically, it, it, it's just a way of classifying a bunch of, a list of information. So remember that like different types of HTML elements have a different purpose. A H1 is a big header, so it will come with it a certain features of things like big text, uh, bold font, and stuff like that. When you go down the category and you go into H6, for example, you know that's a smaller header, smaller font, smaller colors. Uh, then you have things like unordered list, L U L. And inside you have LIs, which is just a list item, for example. Um, so each of these have meaning. So um, and a particular set of things that come with it, uh, like whether or not this is a display block element or a display inline. There are some presets you, that you can overwrite and stuff, but in general, there is a purpose for this. So because we're going to make a list, uh, we've chosen to use an unordered list here with an ID, my list. So this is just saying, hey, look for this element inside my HTML file, um, my DOM, uh, called um, my list element. So you grab it. So then, um, basically, the, the I would say computer computer would know to find this piece, okay? So they know what you're trying to reference to when you create this variable, and this is a constant one means you're not going to change where you want to assign your list to. You know you specifically want to put it in this one, so there's no need to change it. So now for the fun part of stuff, uh, this is on line thirty six, basically a for loop. Uh, which allows you to go through um, mm, a particular piece of code multiple times, so to go through the array and do something with it. So that's what you call looping. The behavior is called looping. I'll explore more in details later. I'll explain more in details. Now it's really just to like give you a bit of information, cl clarify with me if there are some parts which are not clear what the code is trying to achieve, uh, and then you can do it yourself. So basically, this is a for loop to say like. Hey, my current item um, is this. So by this point in time, after having gone through these four lines, my to-do list inside would have a whole bunch of objects with this stuff in it already. So when you get here, the current item is basically saying, hey, um, oh, okay, let's index. Hey, look at my to-do list and look at this number. Okay, so on my to-do list, for example, like just now we had an array of one, two, three, four. Um, each of them have a sequential index number to refer to in the index, in the array. Because you want to be able to find um, a particular thing that you want. And if you know, for example, I'm just, I just want to loop through the entire array. I'll loop through all the indexes of the array. What is interesting though, is that uh, Somebody very evil decided to name the first element index zero. 
So <laughs> there's always a problem with off by one and stuff like this. So this is very important for you to remember. Sometimes you might loop through arrays and you're like you're starting with the index one and you're like I seem to be missing something. Uh, that, that that is why because the first item inside an array is index zero. The last item in the array is the length of the array minus one. Okay, so index zero is like ground zero. I mean, there are some things uh, in life or internationally that we take for granted, like in Singapore, how um, like the what you call ground floor is level one, whereas in Europe, for example, the ground floor is level zero. It's attached to zero, it's just zero. And then the second floor, what we know as second floor is first floor. Let's just say I got really lost. Uh, so, but that helped me to remember like index can actually start with zero because remember there are different conventions in different places. Uh, it's not just how things are in Singapore. So by saying this, uh, it's saying, hey, grab this item, current item, with this index number, uh, starting from here. So let index number start with zero. Um, then you start to evaluate until then you start to do this thing inside inside this curly brace, this whole thing, because this for loop includes the whole thing. So let's start with index number zero. Let's do this whole thing until the index hits less than the full length. Remember I said because we start with index zero, the last item in an array is actually the length minus one. So you can do evaluations like less or less than equal. But if you try to do less than equal the length um, of the array, you are going to get a mistake because nothing exists in the last piece. So what you do is you just typically do less than the length of the array. So it just makes things a little bit easier to write as well, uh, but a little harder to grasp in the beginning. Um, so what you're doing is you let this, um, you, create, do, you do this loop, these uh, things inside. Um, each time you are run, running through, you do a plus plus. Okay, so this is the criteria. Okay, so. Uh, you start with index 0, you do this thing, does this criteria still meet? If you still meet, uh, plus plus, do it again. That's essentially how it works. Okay, uh, so inside this thing, you have let emoji, so you kind of know emoji will change. So, current item type, current item, Understand, remember that current item refers to the item inside the array, which is this one for the first one, which is index 0. It's going to evaluate the word type. So remember in objects, it's a meaningful grouping of uh, properties. So you start to evaluate, OK, let's check current item, which is the first one, for example, when we start first. Um, current item type, let's check the type. Is it shopping? This is a switch case, uh, which I'll explain more in detail later. So it will basically just try to match whether or not it fulfills that case. Okay, uh, inside this string here. It has a very specific syntax that you just need to remember. Or just look up. Uh, so type, type is going to evaluate one by one and see whether it matches. So first, oh, first one it hits already, it's shopping. So the emoji is going to be the shopping emoji. And so if it hits, brick means you'll skip the rest of these ones. Okay? So then when you go on to, to um, create a new element, a new list element, you do, for example, uh, document.create element li, which is like a list item, uh, which sits inside ul. Okay, so it's very typical that ul has something like this, uh, and then there's li, first item. Oh, it's not JavaScript, I need to write strings. Uh, second item. This is generally what a list looks like. There's the Oh, is it too small? Yeah. Hey, if you can't see things, do, do just flag, okay? Uh, there's such thing as ordered list, unordered list, stuff like that. But here we just go with unordered list because we want our array to control the thing. Okay, so generally what is happening is that you are getting this, which is currently empty right now, nothing inside. Oh no, so lonely. Um, and then you're <laughs> inserting elements inside, which is the li stuff, okay? So this is what you're trying to achieve. Let me delete that. Oh, oh. So you're checking if the current element is done. So done false. Okay, if it's done, then you will give it a class name done, which then I assume you will style in a certain way, 
which uh, includes cancelling it out. But if it's not done, then it's just per normal. So then, um, so what you're going to do is you're basically saying, hey document, create this element type called li for me. Um, this element type, I want to assign a class name if the status is done. And then uh, for each one, I want to give a text, okay? Uh, so you inside li, you, you insert the emoji, which you have uh, found through going through this switch case. And you include the name of the item, which is this one. So essentially what you're trying to achieve is to, in an empty list, insert each one of these ones. Um, depending on the type, first insert the emoji here. And then get the name of the task. Okay. So if the item is status done, there will be a specific class to it called done. And that done will create the strike truth. Uh, is that what you wrote? Yeah, because if you have the class, then the text decoration name is slide true. I can also change it to color red, anything I want. Um, and then inside the my list element, which is the original one, the UL, remember, um, you will append child. So each one of these are called child. So there are some relationships like parent child relationship. So when something sits inside another uh, element, it is called a child element. Okay. So for those of you familiar with jQuery, that's where you get a lot of this kind of DOM assessors with like parent, child, sibling, all that kind of stuff. I'm just surprised they didn't write like, hey, get grandmother uh, element, you know, something like that. Instead of get parent, 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 parent item. Yeah. So um, let's see if I miss anything. Okay, so just a recap, this is what the code does. Uh, it's now time for you to try it out, play with it. Remember the different elements that are involved over here? Um, you can also involve some of the CSS styling that you've done previously. You can change the color of the things that are done. You can make it light gray if you want, things like that. Um, so just, just go ahead and try it. Um, five minutes? So five minutes, just fiddle around. I'm going to quit talking so you guys can actually focus on playing with it. Uh, if you need any help, raise your hands. The TAs are fully ready and operational, like robots. <laughs> okay. Again, instead of five minutes, I did 15, so I hope there was enough time uh, to kind of like grasp and play around. Uh, do you feel like you understand a little bit better of what I've been speaking about earlier through doing the exercise? If yes, say yes. yes. Oh, okay, good. Uh, you might also be a little bit more confused right now because instead of just understanding theory, you actually need to type it. Uh, you realize there are little things like opening text, closing text, you put the child inside, stuff like that. That's perfectly normal to be slightly confused. Okay, uh, so basically all these things are just to show you like how do you take a piece, a group of data, a collection of data for example, and then insert DOM elements. So insert things into the page so that it shows up, you know, and you don't have to keep writing the same thing again. Because, uh, so for example, if you write HTML traditionally, uh, I guess you can call it decorative. It basically is very verbose. You're writing every single thing and your HTML file becomes like ginormous. Because like whatever you're trying to build, you need to write every single piece again and again and again and again. And so in the old school way, the HTML file is huge. So by using JavaScript, you're able to repeat the same behavior of what you want to write over a huge collection of information. So you don't have to write it yourself and it's also dynamic because when you change the, the data source or the, the data that you're, that you're using, like the whole page can change without you having to go into this uh, HTML file and changing stuff. Okay, so that's the reason of connecting things like an array of collection information, information collection. Alright, so let's move on to lesson five. Boom. Okay, so safe. How not to repeat yourself? I've been repeating myself all day. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, okay. 
So uh, exercise 5.1. So there is this thing in programming where you say we call it dry. So it's not to say like my humor is very dry. It's to say don't repeat yourself. Okay. So essentially, like when you're coding, the whole point is to make things very maintainable, uh, very efficient, um, and clear to other people. So the less lines of code you write to do the thing you need to do, um, the more maintainable it is because there are less places where errors can happen. And as you go along, you start to appreciate the more succinct your code is, um, the easier for you to find the problems of where a particular issue is coming from. We call that debugging. So you're going to spend a lot of time debugging. So if you have just now used that previous piece of code and you're trying to change something, and it didn't work according to how you're expecting. And so you started thinking to yourself, all right, where did I go wrong? What does this piece of code do? What does that do? That is essentially the process of debugging. It's, it's something that a lot of us spend most of our day doing. <laughs> um, and hopefully as time goes by, you spend less and less time doing that. Um, but it's an extremely important skill to be able to pinpoint where a problem comes from within your code or someone else's code. So, uh, so we have this concept called don't repeat yourself. So, um, so as it goes along, we start to have things called functions, for example. Functions is just a way to do one particular action. Or it can be, you can group multiple behaviors to go into a function. But so you don't have to rewrite the same behaviors you want to happen again and again. You write it into a function. So for example, just now, the thing that's happening inside a for loop, you can group that into a function as well to, say, to call it creating elements, uh, creating new to-do list item, like that. And then you can add in all the, uh, all the things, okay? Uh, so let's create a file name lesson5.html. Be very careful when you're writing the syntax. You can literally just copy it, lesson5.html. Um, remember that dot indicates file extension, and that's a HTML file. So if you name it correctly for dot HTML, your VS code will know to interpret it as a uh, HTML file and it'll give you the correct linting and colors and all that stuff. Okay, so please copy this piece and, and put it into a file named lesson5.html. So you can even see like VS Code knows when it's .html. You see the little icon changes, you know. So it's quite fun. Uh, later we have another and then along with it, create another file called lesson5.js. Put it into the folder. So you can see based on your file extensions, like um, your VS code will even tell you, hey, this is a different type of file. So that's really convenient when you're trying to find things uh, quickly and you know what you're dealing with. So copy and paste this whole piece of code uh, into the HTML file. The HTML one, not the JavaScript one, yeah? Paste it. Click Save. And then inside the JS file, JavaScript file, that's why it's .js, copy and paste this whole piece as well. and save it. Ooh. Close your lesson 4 file so you don't get confused. Do together. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, open your lesson5.html in the browser. You will see something like that. Is everyone here? Not in this room, but here? <laughs> see, see, things are very abstract, you know? That, that, that's programming. Make it less abstract. Okay, so most of you are here already. If you're not and you're struggling to get to this piece, um, please raise your hand. Your TAs are very helpful and ready to help. Click here and say, okay, um, maybe can one of you tell me something that's on your to-do list for today? One to-do list for today? Is everyone just going to go home and go home to Noah in Hawkins? That's what I do. Okay. Go home to relax on the bed. That's my cat. That's my hobby. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll write it in. I'll click add. Ooh, you see my cat picture. Okay. So what what is happening here that allows this to happen? You know, previously your previous piece of um. The lesson four, it shows you how it, how it renders and all that. But how do you have this interaction in order to show up, for this to show up? Okay. So, um, let me make it a bit Basically, what has happened is that you have created a HTML file and you reference an external script. Okay, and this is where it happened. So, previously you saw that the script tag was written inside the body, for example, but you can also load this file inside the head. Okay, you call it load the file. Uh, similarly, it's a similar behavior you can do for CSS. You can also make it into a separate file and then load it into the document in the head. So this is what happened. So in the past, what happens was like HTML files basically got too big. Like everything was inside this ginormous like 2,000 line uh, piece and it got really hard to debug, really hard to maintain. Like um, multiple people need to work on the same file. No, that just doesn't work out. So what happens is you basically try to maybe modularize something. So you try to uh, put things into a meaningful area on its own so that you know this piece of file does this thing, this piece of file does that thing, and this piece of something does another thing. So like the CSS file will handle my styling for me uh, of a particular type of styling. My, this particular script is for me to be able to add an item to my list. Um, so you name it accordingly so that you can start to isolate each of these behaviors into meaningful kind of uh, objects on its own. File, not the object. So you can actually put multiple ones and they will load in sequence in general if you don't do anything else special. Um, so on the right hand side here you see lesson5.js. This is pretty much essentially, uh, well it's not totally the same, but you'll see a bit of the same things of what it does. Um, here. Okay? So each of these grouping of behavior here, for example, is called a function. Like I mentioned, function is one thing that is supposed to do, if you want to be strict, it's supposed to carry out one behavior. Not one behavior as in one line of code, but one type of behavior. Like for example, for me, uh, the idea of function, means function will be one of them buying groceries. It sounds like one line of code, but it really isn't. It involves me getting dressed, uh, brushing my teeth, going out the house, getting to the shop by walking, um, walking into the right grocery shop, uh, getting the ingredients, paying for the cart, and then making it back home. That is one meaningful action of calling buying groceries. So that is one function that I have. For example, Min is able to buy groceries because inside that piece of repeatable code, I know what to always do and where to go, my favorite supermarkets and stuff. So that is essentially what is called a function, okay? It's a meaningful grouping of behavior in code. Uh, so in general, it is good behavior to return something from a function. 
uh, depending on your paradigms as well. But it's it's fine also for it to not specifically return something. Okay, um, like you're gonna see this here. For example, the function called reset form. It it carries out a behavior, but it doesn't exactly return you something. Um, so you're able to write functions in different manners to execute them. Uh, so it's really up to you how you want to write it. So the second example you see, add new to do actually does return. Um, this is a simple return that just returns true, which probably just means like, hey, this function worked, so it returned true. Okay. Um, so by default, this one, if you don't write return, it's just going to return now. And um, now, undefined, zero, and false, they basically all evaluate to, uh, a, a, not really a boolean, they evaluate to saying no, okay? So basically, they all kind of evaluate the same way. So there is true and there is false. And in that behavior, um, a few of these things behave in the same way to say, hey, nothing happened or it failed or whatever. So it will by default return now. Okay? Now means like doesn't exist. So uh, let's just take a guess at what these functions do. Ooh, ooh, what did I press? Quiz time. Uh, so what does line, okay. So the, the reason why there are so many numbers on this side is really just for you to be able to quickly reference to see where in the code you're talking about. And so the, the IDE can tell you which line has something gone wrong and stuff like this, okay? So it's very common to refer things to by lines. So let's look at line 10 of the JS file. Can anyone tell me what line 10 is supposed to do? If you can, means that Mike did a great job naming the thing. <coughs> Answers? I'm going to stand here until I get one. Huh? I heard something? Yes. So basically, it displays the to-do list. Is that correct? What do you guys think? It creates a function in a display to-do. Mm -hmm. It creates a function only named as to do. Uh, that's actually an accurate interpretation of exactly line 10. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. But I also meant the, the whole function. This is correct. So basically, yes, what it does is, uh, like previously in the script of lesson 4, what it does is it, it goes in to find my list element, which is that ul with the my list, which is inside this file, which you don't see. It loops through it, assigns it an emoji, creates the, the LI item that goes into that UL, um, defines whether or not it is done by giving it a strike through styling, uh, creates the inner text, which is basically the text that goes in inside the LI with the emoji, the current um, item's name, which is, for example, for me, go home to relax and hang out with my cat. And then my list element, you append the child my list element. So basically, it's not just really just displaying or so, it's also kind of creating it for you at the moment. But this is essentially what it is. It displays the to-do list exactly like what you said. Uh, so let's try line 47. Ooh, just now I, I added lines so the lines might change. <laughs> so what does line 47 do? What the function do, not the line. You look at the two pieces inside, and what does it do? It clears the text box after you add something, and the default option is Perfect. <coughs> so this is essentially what it does. It goes to the document. It looks for the element ID to do text field. Um, and then it finds it. It's an input field, which is the one where you input all the text, okay? And then you reset the value to say nothing. Okay, so when you're typing in, actually what is happening is whatever you're typing in is going into this input. So 
in this function, what it does, it, it resets it, which means it brings the, the it takes the string out, and replace it with an empty string. If you see two, two like uh, quotations like this, or like this, these are just empty strings. There's nothing inside. Okay. And then it also resets. Uh, so basically, to do category field. So we look for this one. It looks for the ID, which is the select, which is basically this one. And it resets the value to others, which will then just show you this one. So that is what the function does. Do you start to get the hang of the idea of what functions do, how they should be grouped, that they should execute like one particular type of behavior? Okay. So moving on, we have line 52. Add new to do's. What does this function do? Can somebody walk me through the lines of code if you're comfortable doing so? Can you walk me through what is happening from line 52 to 61? It's a code walkthrough. Anyone brave enough to try? It's okay to get it wrong, you know. Oh, yeah, cool. So, so. in line 53, mm -hmm. is the text field, if the length is zero, then, and if the button was pressed, nothing will happen. So, but if the length of the field, like if you add characters or something, then um, the text will be filled and will be pushed to the list. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. According mm -hmm. to the category. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay, cool. And the class won't be uh, added because it's false. Do, does everyone follow? Yeah? Okay, thank you. So for example, for, for this line, uh, like she mentioned, what is happening is like, sometimes you check whether or not there's even a, a reason to do this, you know? Like, if the input didn't change or there's nothing input, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't add it. Otherwise, you end up adding a lot of strange kind of values. So this is one particular pattern people like to do. They do, they check to see if, hey, do I need, even need to execute this function first before I do it? Yeah, that's great. And then finally, we have line 63, which is this one. Sheldon, do you cover event listener last week? Dun -dun. This is a extra bonus question. Does anyone know what an event listener is? Or anyone wants to tell me? Maybe some know, but they want to tell me. No? Okay. So I'll just carry on. So basically what is happening when you do add event listener is you're telling the... You're telling... Um, well, specifically your document. <laughs> okay. So you're telling this... You're assigning to this piece of document an event listener, which will look for a particular thing, and then add a function to it. It sounds like a mouthful, but this is essentially what is happening. So that when the event happens, that function will execute. Okay, so this is a, a very big high level one. Normally you can do things like you add event listeners to a button or stuff like that. This one you add to the document, uh, DOM content loaded. So when the DOM content loaded means that the HTML, what you know as the HTML file basically loaded, evaluated, passed, everything. So then it will then execute that callback function. We call that a callback function because it's an anonymous callback function, which basically means this function just sits there until it's ready to be executed. Okay? Um, so this is what it does. Better if I'm standing at the computer than staring at the screen. So basically when the document loads, uh, the, this function will execute. So at first it will do something called, it will display the to-dos, um, you'll find, you'll go to the document, you'll create a constant uh, reference variable called to do form by looking for in the document here for this thing called a to do form. There's one thing I like to do to make things easier, even though I can already see in this example, so I just command find and then it will highlight for me what I'm talking about when I'm stepping through my code. Okay, so you create a reference called to do form and then uh, you add to that form a listener called submit. Okay, 
Because uh, so this is one where it's not such a high level. It's a very specific adding a particular type of listener to a type of uh, element. So this one is for submitting the form specifically. Okay. So what is happening is uh, it renders this. It adds uh, to the form. This whole thing is a form. Um, this whole thing is a form. Okay. It adds to it a submit function which has a callback. It, it's fine to be confused about why it's called callback or what is a callback function. Just essentially know that it is a function that will execute when something goes on. Okay. Um, there are some default behaviors that happen when you click a button, for example, or you click submit and things like that. So this line um, you will see around in the future. Uh, you don't really have to know it so much. It's basically just saying like, hey browser, default, uh, prevent the default event that's going to happen. I want to overwrite that with what I want to do instead. So then you um, create uh, two more variables called to do text. You look in the document for the ID called to do text field, which is this one we should talk about earlier, the value. And then um, it will basically display, which means it will kind of basically create this element again. And then after it's done, reset the form. Resetting the form is just resetting this part and not here. Okay? So this is where you can see like where functions come into place and where they're executing it. If you just type the name of the function, function to do, nothing happens. Okay? You need to add the parentheses behind the function in order to execute it. So this display to do is essentially this one, the one on top. Here. So what you're saying is you're asking it to run. This bracket here is very is different than when you're executing, okay? This is just a syntax for a function. Unfortunately, this is just the part where you have to remember how to write a function. A function you have right you declare the thing you declare to your uh, code saying uh, I'm writing a function with this name. This, the brackets there are just for you to pass in some parameters and stuff and then the square bracket is the body of what executes in that function. Okay, The ability to take things in here like for example ID numbers, um, um, emoji, if you want to override it you can pass it in a function like this and then what will happen in this ID and emoji is it will show up here. Emoji for example but of course, you need to create a reference to an emoji. Emojipedia. So I just really enjoy looking for Emojipedia. Oh no, I closed it. Do things every day that make you happy. Oh, he did already have, so I'll create another one. So it, ex it exists the possibility if you write the code in another way, okay, if you want to pass in a particular type of variable or values to a function. So this is what happens over here. I can pass in an emoji and I can replace this emoji with this emoji instead of the emoji that happened here. I can say new emoji and just replace with this one. So all of them will then become cats. And here I don't even need to name it differently because there's something called scope. Okay, so variable namings are relevant to the scope of the function you're inside. So I can actually have the same name but refer to different things. So that's called scoping. It's a separate concept that you can learn in the future. But basically, this is what will happen. If I'm not mistaken, this should work. Oh, I broke it. Oh, because I have ID, there's nothing. So I've overwritten all of them with a cat emoji. So this is how functions work. They're very powerful, uh, and you can write it in the way that suits what you want to do. Okay. And so a function that doesn't have a name is called an anonymous function. Surprise, surprise, you know. 
Okay. Uh, is everyone still with me? Anyone lost someone floating in the South China Sea? I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you kind of get the ideas of what functions are? Uh, the idea of grouping your scripts into a separate file, um, that you try to cluster behaviors in different functions, you assign them a meaningful name, and they do a group of behavior that does that achieves the objective that your function is called. And that you can also pass specific values into functions, for example, to overwrite what is already written inside that function, which is what commonly happens. Yeah? And functions, usually you can return a value or you can don't return a value. If you don't return a value, it returns now by default. Yeah? Functions are basically your fundamental building block as well. Okay. Anyone mind blown? No one likes my new emoji. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. So um, let's move on. Okay. Uh, so let's move on now to exercise five point two. Okay. Please open your lesson five JS file and replace the code in it. Not all the code, only the function called display to dos. So I very carefully and gingerly copy and paste this particular one. I look for specifically only this one. When you click the function, you will see that your IDE, your, your editor will open up. Uh, it will highlight for you where is the beginning and end of that function. Otherwise, it's very easy to get lost between where is the beginning and end of another function sometimes because you have so many curly braces and stuff like that. So that is usually what happens that present people don't deal with. So you take this piece, only this piece, which is the display to do, that ends here, you delete it, and then you paste the new one in. What's the difference? Ah? Toggle to do. Oh, okay. Ooh, fancy. Create the link and Ooh, very fancy. It's the bottom part. It's the bottom part. So pro tip, if you uh, hover your mouse over the, the function display to do on the left and you go to do us the left, you find a little chevron, a little arrow there. If you click it, you actually collapse that the entire function in one line. Right? So uh, and it's right right up. We're gonna go there. On uh, top, like line ten, you go to line ten right now, you just hover on top and the little arrow thing that appears. If you click that, it actually collapses that line. So if, so you, you can then delete that line. So sometimes if your code disappears, it's only because you collapsed it, so just open it. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> that happens. So has everyone uh, copied and pasted it and refreshed your index.html? Oh, yeah. Oh, yo, blow. There's a new function that you need to add. Okay. Uh, Copy and paste this one. Toggle to do. And just pop it at the end of the file. Actually, I prefer to pop it here. <coughs> okay. Okay. So, look okay. Replace uh, display to do function and add a new function at the bottom called toggle to do. Right? Wow, so exciting. It's not sarcastic. Huh? Not sarcastic. Okay. Very, very exciting. Mm. Now, let's repeat. Petting cat. Okay, is everyone here? Have you copied and pasted? Replaced the display to do list one and also added the toggle um, to do's? Okay, I see a couple of nods now, so I'm going to carry on. Uh, if you are. Uh, if the page is not rendering, rendering, that's a term, uh, as expected, uh, please raise your hand. The TAs are, help, are free to help you. 
they are very happy and eager to be helping so like please feel free don't feel paise don't feel like shy about it uh, that's what they're here to do today <coughs> okay uh, so as you can see now whoa you can toggle the to do this so if you click it by mistake you're like all oh, right i can undo that it's not a fix whether or not it's done you can use the same to do this every single day if you're attending exactly this workshop uh, to every single day buy oolong tea, buy more cat feed, pet the cat before leaving the house. So I do. Okay, so what is happening is that we have modified the display to do's to add a hyperlink to them. Dun dun. Ooh, this one. So you add something called a, a, a is that a better name than an A? But basically the tag is syntax is just like a two open triangles with an A in it, okay? And it usually has a H ref, whatever. That's usually why you call a link. So that's why you call it a name link element. So then you wrap up your to do item in that. So there are different ways to be able to get interaction. It's not just with buttons that you can do that. You can also do that with links and you can add uh, event listeners to them to do certain things. So there is a flexibility over there regarding what particular you want to do with an element. Uh, you try to work with the purpose of an element first and then after that you add on customizations and stuff you want to do with it. Because what, what has been shipped is always more efficient than what you write yourself in most cases. So try to work with what the purpose is, go with the flow of the purpose of a button, of a link and stuff like that. Okay, um, so on this what you're doing is you're wrapping it with an A tag and then you add an event listener called a click. These event listeners are specific so you try not to invent them yourself most of the time. Uh, the, the idea is that it, it should be like common things, okay, like page load, uh, clicks, uh, stuff like that, hovers. Okay. So what is happening is like when you click on them, what you will do is it will execute this function called toggle to do, which you added over here, which has a new parameter inside called item uh, sequence. Is that what it means? Okay, uh, and then you will refresh and display the to do list. Okay, so what is happening is when it's toggling is that it will. Um, Go to that list, look for the property done. Here, and it will toggle this value. So the opposite of true is false. The opposite of false is true. Yeah? The opposite of true and false is false. True. It's true. The opposite of true and false is true. That has got to do with the confusion I talked about earlier. About how you evaluate true, false, false, true. Okay. So basically this is what is happening. Uh, so the toggle to do list over here will manipulate the data and change it. So that when you re when you request for a redisplaying of the items, you would see the change. Ta da, that's why you get this. Okay. Uh, do we have time to do this exercise? Move certain lines. So it's it's a so we can think about how you want to uh, move certain certain um, functions inside the display to do this into smaller functions so that it's more maintainable and it's much more obvious what each of them does. Like for example, getting emoji. You can move the whole switch case into a function on its own that returns you only the emoji. So that inside your display to-do list, um, your function gets shorter. Yeah. So then you know specifically like, hey, my get emoji function is responsible only for returning me an emoji as long as I give it a type, like a to-do type. So there are some things you can do. Please try it out yourself. Um, yeah. So. So just to recap lesson 4 and lesson 5, um, this is the idea of what <laughs> uh, about flow, calling it artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, so basically the idea is just like if this do that, like if 
if this is true, circuit is closed, you pass it through this light bulb instead. This one is maybe always true, things like that. So the idea is basically just to direct your information flow, direct your behavior flow. That's it. The idea of flow. Like I said, code has pur different purpose, doing calculations and controlling flow. So the if else is uh, basically saying if something, do that. So you have seen this in the code right now that's on your computer. Uh, if the status is done, for example, or if um, in the input to reset form or to add to do, if the length is nothing or zero, whatever, um, then don't do something. Okay. So this helps you to check for a certain behavior before doing things. So if else, if hungry, eat. Else, don't eat. And then the emoji switcher was what we saw just now. It's called a switch case. It's very common in different languages. Uh, basically, you just try to match your variable to whether or not it matches that case, and then you'll return something. It's important to remember to include the word brick for that case if you don't want it to flow into the other cases. If not, it might end up hitting all the others as well. So these are just some little peculiarities. Um, yeah. So uh, in, in lesson five, we talked about the concept of don't repeat yourself, so being dry, basically. Um, I'm starting to lose my voice. So being dry, basically, so one of the ways you can do that is to write functions. So you don't need to copy and paste the same kind of code to do again and again and again and again. You group this particular behavior into a meaningful function that you can just call again and again uh, when you need with the parentheses. So you execute them by writing the function's name and with uh, parentheses behind it. So that will execute the function for you. So that can essentially cut down a 100 line, uh, uh, maybe a 20 line um, code that you want to use into just one line. And you re-execute the same piece again. So it's very predictable what happens. There's less places for errors to happen, miss typos, all that stuff. So just going back a little bit uh, out of what just JavaScript is uh, of coding, JavaScript, for example, now, for those who used to know it, uh, we have the syntax of the traditional kind of functions. We call them just, there's actually no particular name for it. If you guys know, let me know. I just call it a regular function. Um, basically, that's when you write uh, this thing. Like function, then you give it a name. You can pass in a parameter if you want. Then you do whatever you want to do inside. If ES6, was it 5? I always forget. Uh, we came about with the arrow functions. So this is just to introduce to you guys. So when you see next week uh, a React and stuff, so you might be able to see code examples online. It might get a bit confusing when you look at React and sometimes people write it with the, the, the declarative one and sometimes people write it with the arrow one. Um, so this is essentially what it is. It, they, they do the same thing. There's a slight difference in terms of the scope. Um, but you don't need to know this right now. Because it's already, you don't need to know this right now. Uh, because, yeah, you'll get the joke in the future. Uh, so basically, this is what's happening. This is essentially the same thing, short of a this. Okay? Um, yeah, so what you can do, like we, we talked about already, uh, let this variable name to do this, which means, hey, tell the API, which I'll talk about later, to get me an article. I'll give you the article's ID number. And then you return me the article, which will most likely return me an object with different properties of what's in the article, the name, the, the page, the author, the writer, stuff like that. And then I'll just return the article. So this is what a function does. It does something very specific, which is get article from the server. Okay. So just two ways to write it, the arrow function or not. So try to master one of them first, like maybe traditionally try to start with the first one. Uh, but it's all up to personal preference. So coming back about the not repeating your code so much, we do things like loop, like the for loop that I spoke about. So it's very simple. Basically, what is going happening is you go into it, you check if the condition is still met, which is the second piece of the for loop. If it's true, then you, you do the action. And if your condition, then once you finish the thing, you go back and check condition true, still true, and then you do it forever. So what is happening is if you write your con if you write your condition wrongly, you could end up in this loop forever and your computer crash. Boom. <laughs> okay, that's a fun one. Uh, yeah, so generally try not to go there. So yeah, uh, you you wouldn't encounter this with JS so much. 
and other languages you have that problem. Uh, so condition checking, if false, then it terminates. So basically we say the loop terminates. That's a term. Okay? So that is what a loop is. You go in, check if criteria is still, hap still fulfilled. If criteria is still met, execute. And you come back, check criteria met, still met, execute. If criteria is no longer met, it just exits. Okay? So there are modern ways of writing it, like I uh, mentioned with someone just now. There is the traditional for loop, which is very common everywhere. But in JavaScript, you have things like uh, array.map, array.foreach. So different ways of looping through something uh, very specifically. So I just wanted to add in a bit of a bonus on conventions in JavaScript that I mentioned earlier already. Uh, the camel casing, this is generally the way that uh, you name your variables, or uh, as you have seen, the examples in the functions. We do this thing called camel casing. Because variable names need to be contiguous. Don't leave spaces between the words. Uh, semicolon is in other languages or stuff. Uh, you won't see that in Python, I think. Uh, just to indicate that this particular line of code is finished, evaluate it separately from the for the next. It's, it's not a continuous line. Okay. So I like it basically just as good behavior. Okay. So that was like a huge mouthful. Uh, and now we have to move on to part two. Oh, I thought short break after this one. Yeah, it says uh, lesson one to three, then you get to break. <laughs> I'm a robot. Just tell me what to do. Are you guys ready to soldier on? A soldier on or soldier? Yeah, there's, there's more food right now, so if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Elisha did a. Uh, yeah. I kind of like brought in a, a lot of food. food. Uh, shall we go for 15 minutes? You want to eat now? Yeah. Are we okay? Yeah? Okay. okay. Fill your bellies, refresh your mind, because there's a lot to cover for the next one. And this is a fun one, you actually get to build stuff. I'm going to, ooh, so loud. <laughs> I'm not looking, at, I'm just talking to myself so loud. <laughs> Every time you change the, the direction of the mic, things change. Mic's mic. Um, so yeah, so now we're going to go into what I was talking about, the front and back end uh, earlier, about how the visible things in, just to put it very loosely, you can call them the front end. And the visible things, you can kind of call them the back end. There are even funnier concepts like, uh, back end for front. There's front end, there's back end, and there's always funny things that comes up now, like back end for front end and <laughs> stuff like that to differentiate the back end for front end from the back end back end. <laughs> Sorry, I have to entertain myself with this kind of thing. Uh, so we're gonna look into Node. Uh, I thought for this one, it's slightly more useful for me to run through the information at the same time with the exercises. Um, because to go back to it later, it might, I might completely lose you. Um, that's not what I want to do. Can you guys see the slide? Is it big enough? Okay. Uh, so because of, of uh, time and, and whether or not it is actually super helpful. Uh, I'm going to skip lesson two. Uh, it's not particularly interesting if you want to be a web developer. Uh, it's just basically to tell you that you can run stuff in your command line. Um, generally, you, you don't do this in day-to-day -day life, but you can run it anywhere you want. So let's start. On lesson one, uh, basically the point is that you can run uh, JavaScript on Node. So what exactly is Node? Uh, we don't need to go too much into the buzz, uh, all the keywords, because then uh, each keyword means something, so that's a bit different. But basically, we're just saying like uh, Node.js enables you to use uh, JavaScript on the server uh, because it's a server-side runtime. Uh, you don't need to know about all the other stuff. Um, so basically, what it allows you to do is that now you can create a lot of server-side tools, applications, and stuff like that uh, using JavaScript. Because previously, like I mentioned, JavaScript was meant for browsers and in the front end it comes inbuilt. Uh, now you can also use it on Node. 
And like I said, code doesn't run uh, on its own. It's not just like some magical box where code exists. Uh, code uh, exists uh, in different kind of situations and settings, context, environments, stuff like that. This is one of them. So now they have enabled, they have built something that enables you to use JavaScript, which is just basically a language uh, on server sites as well. Okay. Uh, so basically, the idea of Node is to to allow you to use JS uh, outside of the browser. Okay. So what is the concept of the terminal? Uh, this thing you have called Bash uh, on uh, terminal on Macs, for example, and stuff. Um, so essentially, is the you can use the terms uh, interchangeably. I'm not sure if actually in reality there's a big difference between the term terminal and console. Uh, so basically, it just gives you access. It's like a shell ex shell access. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, tell me if I, I'm I'm losing I'm losing myself trying to think about how I would want to understand this a couple of years ago. Uh, it's an inter like interface in order to get into your machine, okay? Like into your, your machine. Uh, so I call my computer my machine. Basically, I call all of these things machines, okay? They are essentially machines. So yeah, so let's do this. So open your terminal. And the terminal gives you access to basically your OS. Uh, do you know where it is? Uh, ca can you see this? So on your bar, you'll see this little icon that I'm dragging out just to show you here. <laughs> okay, open your terminal, please. Uh, and Mac is called terminal. Uh, Windows, I don't know what you call it. On the Mac, uh, bring up your Bash. spotlight, so which is uh, command space. Command space. And type terminal. I'm trying to drag it up. Uh, uh, okay. On the uh, Windows, just open your uh, no, no. bar in your from the start and type command prompt or command. So you can see a black screen pop up. Terminal? Thing this is a terminal. It looks like this. Yes, command. Uh command prompt. Command prompt. Can I find it? You tango again. So for, for Mac users might be a white screen, uh, or for Windows users might see a black screen instead. Um, of course, you can also customize the color, but that's, that's a subject for a different day. <laughs> yeah. Make a font screen. Dun dun. Does, it, does everyone have their console or terminal up? All good? Okay, cool. So I, I like to wish myself like uh, have a wonderful day, so you know, it prints every time I open it. <laughs> but this is not the computer I use on a daily basis. Um, so basically what you can do is, uh, if you have already done install fast, you can type node-just version. This will tell you the version of node you're running. It should be version 10. It should be 10.16.0. It's a new LTS? Yeah, huh. My things are very outdated. <laughs> <coughs> so you shouldn't be version 8, but j j just for extra information, you can have several different versions of Note on your computer. Uh, I use something called MVM, so you can change between different Note versions. Different Note versions support or come inbuilt with different things. Um, don't need to think too much about it right now, but basically Node is just like the, the layer that you that, that you're building on top of, kind of. Um, so you have different versions, you can switch between them depending on your project's dependencies, so what your project depends on. So you'll commonly hear like your project depends on a Node, a particular version of Node and uh, after, and you generally don't hear a particular version of Node and before. Because uh, as it goes along, you just tend to get more things. Okay, oh, very cool. So now, if you want to get into the fun part, you can type node. And then you see this little triangle starts to open up. It basically means you can start to write, like, uh, you can start to write things in it. So inside this terminal space, you're entering into the, the JS environment, so you can start to write things, okay? 
so now this is the fun part. How do you get out of this? <laughs> so like in, in like in the browser, for example, there was the console that we saw earlier that supports it out of the box that like you can write whatever you want. If you're inside the terminal, you can also type node so that you can start to write uh, or just do like little things and things like that. Generally, what we do is, uh, I, I don't tend to go into this, uh, but you can start to write whatever you want, like, hi, hey, uh, the name equals to min. So name min. So basically, you're replicating the same kind of uh, behavior environment that you had, that uh, you're seeing in the console in the browser earlier. This is just to show you that you can access a uh, node on your terminal. Okay. So we're going to quit it by typing Control C two times, or you can also type dot exit. One of the most fun thing is learning how to exit things in your terminal. <laughs> there are some inescapable things. Could be remit. It's the most common question on Stack Overflow: how to escape things. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's a Facebook group for tech ladies. If you get stuck anything, <laughs> just write. <laughs> One of us will reply and say, hey, this is the solution. If you don't find it on Stack Overflow. Okay, so this is basically just telling you what Node is. It's just an environment that allows you to write JavaScript. Okay, on the server side, on your machines. I call these machines. So um, I won't go so much into details, but let's try next. But basically, you can do what we're doing, like the let name equals to whatever that was from part one from the previous lesson to go into it. So you can write JavaScript here now. So that, 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 that is just to let you know that, hey, you can do this now, like in the console in the browsers. Oh, I'm really cold. Now, moving to lesson two. So we're going to just try running a JS script in the command line just to show you how to do it. Let's create a new file named lesson2.js. So please open up your VS Code again. I'm close this off. We call it lesson2.js. I'm going to delete my test app. Okay, just copy and paste this information into the file. So all these seem very dry right now, but like, oh no, I shouldn't have gone through this, but it's fine. Um, so basically, I'm going to go quicker because I'm not going to explain it so much, it's, but it's just to tell you that, hey, you can run this file in your command line. So you're going to see in my directory, in my terminal, uh, I'm here already. So how I get into things is, I type cd. Um, so when I type ls, you can see all the files that are inside right now. There's something called lesson2.js. If I want to run it, I'll just type, uh, I have autocomplete, so I'll just do this. I type node.js, lesson2.js, so it will prompt me. So basically what is happening is, um, here I'm asking node, hey node, please run this file for me. It's a JavaScript file. And then I get to do things like what's your name and I say my name is Min. Min the Clumsy. And then it will tell me like, hey, your name is Min the Clumsy, which is exactly the one from here. Yeah, I keep changing. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is basically just to show you, go back and, and try. You can run a script inside uh, using node. Next. Are you able to execute the file? So you probably need to find the folder from inside your terminal first. Uh, probably the what you want. So, um, so remember, I, I asked you to, uh, to save your folder in your desktop, right? Oh, yeah. So what you do in your, in your for back users, you just type cd space curly brace like curly line tilde 
slash uh, desktop, you should basically get to your folder. Secrets? Doesn't work on command prompt. For 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 yeah, uh, for DIR? for Windows users. <laughs> for Windows users, so uh, was it ch ch dir uh, change that entry. I think it's something desktop. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I wanted to skip this. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. And then I went to it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for Mac, for Windows users, your LS, which is the list of folders, is actually in, in, uh, uh, in DIR in Windows, which is to show you the contents of your directory. DIR is the content of a directory. Uh, probably should have added this. this yeah, I should have added it in. But actually, it's a, it's a shortcut. Go back to your Visual Studio Code. Uh, you and click on View. Oh, sorry. Uh, View Terminal. Oh, actually, you can right click open in terminal. Okay. Okay. So it's here. But it will not open into a separate one. It will run inside your VS Code. Okay. So it's directly in the folder. If I type ls to find the files inside, uh, yeah. for Windows, you can type dir. Eh? dir. Yeah. Then uh, you can just type node. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Lesson to dot js. Yeah. Okay, so this is to, just saying like. To get to this window, you just, uh, was it terminal or new terminal? So what I'll do is I'll right click here, open in terminal. Okay, so it's All good for everyone else. You managed to open the terminal, uh, just run the file for fun. So basically, the concept of like uh, MIGDER, um, CD, LS, it's just a way for you to traverse through your file folder. These are just commands in the terminal. Uh, normally developers, we use a lot of that because it just makes life a lot easier than clicking folders, opening, looking and stuff. Uh, it's just fast to type, so we can go very fast like this. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what, what is the command line? Uh, you normally will see things like command line interface, CLI, stuff like that. Uh, it's basically just for you to type commands directly. <laughs> and the idea of a directory is basically just like uh, where your files are. These are just terminologies to remember. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't anticipate this complexity. Sorry about that. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> No, I wanted to skip, but I totally forgot. Then I was like, oh, once I started, oh crap, you okay, know, go back. <laughs> but now you know, okay? So uh, you can actually run the files using uh, index.js. So maybe you, on index.js, you, you uh, do some calculations and stuff like that, and you want to run the calculations, you just type no index.js, and it will run the file for you. Remember to return so you get a value. Okay. Now for fun part, let's go into npm. Uh, 
I'm, I'm going to carry on. Uh, so the TAs will help out those who still need uh, any help. So how many of you have heard of the term NPM? How many of you have used NPM? Every day. No. All day, all night. Okay. Uh, so basically, you're just a package manager. So what is happening to introduce you a bit more, not just about JavaScript, but also the ecosystem that exists around it and why it's such a vibrant community right now, uh, is because of sharing code. So on NPM, it is one of the places that allows you to share code. Anybody can push a package onto it. Um, try not to be evil. Uh, yeah, I know I have friends that make funny packages just for fun as a joke. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically, a lot of code, a lot of the basic things that you do is reusable, uh, like something as simple as like um, maybe uh, calculating big numbers. That can be a package. Um, uh, something as simple as um, what other favorite packages? There are a lot of packages like that. Really, like when you look under the hood, there's like five thousand. That's, uh, that's underestimate. There are a lot of different packages that uh, each project uses. So that is that is what we call the environment of not environment. We call it the ecosystem of of JavaScript. It's not just about the language itself, but also all the packages and um, modules that are available for you to reuse. So you don't have to do the same thing again and again. So something as simple as like uh, cloning an object that can be a package on its own and that package can just be something that is 20 lines but everybody uses that because it is well supported and it's well maintained and you know it's uh, pretty much relatively bug free because when you try to write a lot of things yourself especially as a beginner you'll write a lot of bugs into it because you miss all the catch uh, you don't have the catch all and all that stuff so that's why more established people or just anyone that has written something that they think they want to share as a function they just push it on on npm as a package so that's why we're here uh, you're going to hear similar things like Yarn and Bower and stuff. Uh, they can also, but that's not so much a package thing. But they can also help you do all these things. Okay, uh, so NPM is basically this thing called NPMJS. There are also others, some scandal going on. So what's very fun about the JS community or actually the internet community, whatever, is that there are always some kind of gossips and scandals and this is happening and these people are betraying the trust of other people. And it's just very exciting and very, very fun. Um, so now, now there's some scandal going on about NPM because they're like, you're losing your your soul to money and things like that. Ah, oh, all sorts of this stuff. It's really fun. Okay. So uh, anyways, then you'll be able to see this is what we call NPM. So you can do it through the command line because there's an NPM CLI. Okay. And think of the term dependencies as basically projects that your project depend on. That's pretty much what it is. Okay, you import these this projects or other modules as your dependency so that you can use the code that they export. So you don't have to rewrite a lot of things. So that makes things very, um, if any of you have done Ruby on Rails and stuff, I mean, th this kind of behavior is very common. Actually, all languages are. So let's try to create a new NPM package. Ooh, we really want to create an NPM package. Try. Mm -hmm. We're not going to push it too. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> okay, um, so this is pretty much in line with the idea of being modular and not repeating yourself. Um, should we do an NPM package? Yeah, I do. Mm. There's not much value in it. No, no time. Yeah, so basically the idea is that you can create, you can modularize some of your code and, and things into uh, something you call. Uh, an NPM package, uh, and then import it as a dependency in your other projects. So it's quite interesting because you're basically building different Lego blocks, and then you can plug and play into your things and stuff like that. So that's why people like to write things pack like packages. So um, this is a, an exercise that people who are already a bit more experienced in JS and stuff, you can go ahead and try. Even if it's new to you, just go ahead and copy and paste and run the exercise. Um, you are just basically creating like a, a new package JSON. Okay, um, so I'll go into the meat of. Uh, sorry for vegetarians. I'll go into the meat of the part two right now, which is to explain to you a bit more about the server things. Okay. So that, is anyone not unclear about my explanation for uh, NPM? 
So NPM is basically just a way for you to de uh, manage your dependencies of your project because you want to reuse code that other people or yourself have written that has been pushed onto the internet with a specific name. So you can't have the same name as another package or else NPM will clash, for example. So something like React is uh, NPM, you also use it as a, you install it as an NPM package. For example, uh, React Router, you install it as an NPM package, uh, all sorts of things that you can use as an NPM package. So you just write it in. Okay, uh, so I believe you'll touch a lot more about that next week, so then you'll get more familiar. So let's move on to lesson four, intro to Express.js. So basically, what is the idea of Express? So, maybe I should just stand. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, what is happening nowadays is that you don't just write an index.html and then like let it sit like a static file on the internet. Uh, you do you you do something called serving your files. Okay. You serve your static files. You serve whatever. So uh, Express is just uh, a very lightweight uh, frame. It's considered a framework. Yeah. A very lightweight framework to do that for you. So you can write things like routes, you can uh, write a server to serve your files, your projects and stuff like this. It's very powerful depending on how you're using it, it's very commonly used as well. Um, so, so ideally, uh, just basically, if you want to do web development, you should get familiar with the concept of Express. There are also other alternatives, but Express is what is shipped uh, together with Node, uh, just by default. It's a standard de facto one now. So basically, uh, the idea of a server is just a machine that serves you files. Okay, so I mean the the, ter the term is kind of unintuitive, but it's, it's pretty much just what it is. Okay, yeah, yeah. and so uh, one of the reasons why a lot of things are moving now to the server, for example, is that uh, in servers you can control the powers of those machines that you're using. I'm sorry, I keep using the term machines, but I really like it. Uh, so your browsers have limited like processing ability. So if you want to do things that are really uh, intensive, for example, go through a lot of data and all that kind of things, it's better to put it off into, uh, into a server somewhere, wherever you want to locate it, to do all that processing for you and then simplify the response and give it back to you. Because you keep doing that in your, if you keep doing a lot of very intensive activities inside the browser, like your user's screen will start to hang, it starts to slow down, like when you click something, it just loads forever, all that kind of stuff. So you try to move all that kind of behaviors where possible or where meaningful into like server. Uh, but that depends on your network time as well. So there is a, there's always some kind of playoff and judgments that you're doing over there when you're deciding what to move uh, to the back and what you're keeping in the front. Okay, uh, that's, I mean, uh, I, I use the terms uh, freely, so, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if maybe sometimes the term is not very clear. So maybe uh, a term like client, do you guys know what it is? <laughs> okay, so anyways, <laughs> okay. So uh, client is not really like a person, it's not like a, someone you're serving, whatever. A client is basically just like a way for you to access something. It's very simple, but these are very regular uh, jargons that I use, like client. Client can be like your browser, stuff like that. Okay, so it allows you to access things. So that, that is what we call clients. So you can have a multi-client application, things like this. Uh, and then API. I've always found the term API like very hard to understand. I'm like, what is the application programming interface? Like it took me forever to really understand fully what it's supposed to mean. I just know what an API is, but I'm like trying to break down the word application programming interface and I'm like, what does this mean? Like sometimes the terms are really like dry and you're like, who names this stuff? But basically like API is just a, a way to, um, a, a way for a service to say, hey, interact with me this way. So when you have two different services or two different things you want to, two different like entities that want to interact with one another, it will, the API will expose itself to say, okay, I have, I give you some methods, some functions, which is like change my name, uh, change uh, input data, uh, send me stuff. You can do it in this way. That's generally what the idea of an API is. It's like a unified way of interacting with the entity. Okay. 
So you see the term API across all the different things you might see with regards to like uh, endpoints, um, which is basically like a, maybe a SaaS service has APIs. You see like other things will have APIs. So this is basically the core idea of it. It's an exposed protocol, not protocol, it's an exposed set of ways of interacting with the entity. Okay. So let's go into express.js. Um, so there's, uh, there's exercise 4.1 and exercise 4.2. Exercise 4.1 is more manual, uh, which will show you how to like uh, write it from scratch, copy paste, all of that. So try this when you're at home. Uh, today we're going to use something called the express generator, which will generate all these files for you. It's just to remind you as well that people have created a lot of tools and, and packages. It is another package to make your life easier to generate all these things for you. Okay. So you can write it from manual if you like, if you're one of those people that enjoy writing this stuff, or you can jump straight to generators. Like for example, with React, uh, create React app is also a generator. It just creates all the files for you, and then you can run with it. Okay, so let's go into your terminal. This is where I need to sit. So you might have noticed uh, uh, by now already that the VS code has a terminal in it, um, if you like, but otherwise you can also open it as a traditional terminal by command space type terminal. For Windows, I always forget how. Okay, but anyways, I'm just going to do it here. I'm familiar with it here. So uh, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to create a directory. So this command make directory means to create a folder for me. It's, it's very simple. There are all these jargons, but eventually you realize kind of what they mean. It's just like, hey, make a folder for me. Okay, make dir. So I make a dir called my app2. Okay, and then I will type cd which is basically to like, the CT stand for change directory, I don't know. But it basically means to go inside that folder. So after you make dir, please uh, type no spaces in this term. Oh. <laughs> I will type CD my app two. Okay, that means I've gone into that folder. So it's essentially the same when you're opening like the, the, the a very traditional folder, like the finder. Like this, you're essentially doing this inside your command line. You're going, in, you're going into like, like folder stuff. Okay, you're just doing it through the command line. It's the same. What you call this kind of interactive uh, things are called graf uh, GUIs, okay? Graphical user interface. It just makes interacting with the computer a lot easier for most modern humans. Modern humans, <laughs> not ancient humans. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so it, it just makes uh, dealing with things in a graphical manner much easier. Whereas traditionally, actually in the past, you can just type everything like this. Okay, so it's the same thing. Going, typing CD is the same as me double clicking into the folder here, for example. Okay. Is everyone here? Is everyone inside the folder called My App 2? Or whatever you named it? So you should be able to see, th this is like your machine's name, uh, your computer's name, and then this is the folder's name. And this is just my username. So you're all, you're all in it. Cool, cool. In it to win it. Yeah. Who, is, who is in the folder already? 
And so the rest, I assume you need a bit more time. Are you in the folder? Okay, cool. So that's two thirds. Some time. Any questions in the meantime? I know, I know this part is running a bit faster, but it's also the slightly more confusing part. Um, when you think about creating a web application, when you say, oh, creating things like CSS, HTML, all that kind of stuff, it's very intuitive because uh, these are things you see, but now you start to go into the parts which are a bit more abstract, but serve a very good purpose too. So these things like servers, how to write routes and stuff like that, takes a bit of time to grasp uh, if it's a new thing to you. Okay. So if you'd like to go ahead already, you can go ahead and uh, install the Express Generator. So type npx express generator. You can also just copy and paste the command so you don't do it wrongly. Remember to copy and paste it line by line, uh, not together. You need to do npx express generator first, let it run, and then do the npm install. <laughs> so uh, type enter, and then npm goes off to do like it's, it's all its job. Okay. So once it's done, it has terminated, then we'll get here. Does anyone have problems with MPX? Yeah. Does, does MPX work for all of you? So basically, when you type npx express generator, you're saying, hey, go and fetch this package for me. That's it. You haven't installed it yet. It's just saying, go to the, go to the central repo where it's, it, it is in npm and fetch that thing for me. Mike. Uh, uh. Oh, I can come in. Oh, I haven't reached there. I just came. Oh. The NPF, the debug. Well, uh, but you haven't, have you installed all this stuff yet? Uh, it's good. Okay, I'm going to start. Okay, it's good. 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 Okay, it's just copy and paste. Uh, you can just type NPM star. Don't you type the debug? Oh, star? NPM star. No, no star. Oh, no star. Yeah. Okay. Enter. Uh, oh. Oh, that's because uh, your window is uh, Can you allow access? <coughs> Command not <from. laughs> You're supposed to say it has started. Oh. Uh, do you mind if I... Yeah, sure. I'm not familiar with Windows. Though. <laughs> yes. MPX expression, right? you're inside the file, you typed it, you installed, try to start it. Hold on, huh? Uh, Windows. Uh, Windows has just. It just stops at the bin. The, the, does the debug command run on Windows? Uh, uh, that, that's the problem, I don't know. Oh, okay. I think yeah, some sort of have it. Okay, uh, just open your local browser and see if anything happened there. Local browser? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, open the, the browser. Yeah, uh, Oh, the browser? Yeah. Uh, type here. Type here? Yeah, okay. Uh, go to localhost 3000. Oh, sorry, what? what uh, you can go here. Yeah. Copy and paste this address. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it works already. Oh. <laughs> it's just because the, the debug thing, maybe that's a, a Mac terminal specific thing. But npm start is, is, is everywhere. Alright, so I don't even need the asterisk. No, that just means star, which means all. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, is this installed? Uh, which was your last? Install? Yep, it means it's done. So you can type npm start now. This is mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
But then you might see like nothing is happening. Like, it's it's correct. I was like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And then you go and open the local host street dance room. Okay. <laughs> I got this instead eh? after the MPX after the MPX express generator then it's this cup it out <laughs> oh you need to type sudo um, so you need someone to help you because in Windows so sometimes oh, okay, your okay. file directions are protected so it could, it could, that could be the case ok ok, okay so one of the instructors will do okay. uh, so I'm uh, ok uh, so I'm going to carry on. I see a lot of people have already started going on with the express generator and stuff. Uh, so let me get there as well. <coughs> so now that we're here, we do uh, MPX. Oh, you need help. I'm not sure. Oh, that's fine. Uh, it, it's a Mac doesn't, uh, your Windows doesn't understand the bug. Just type npm start. Okay, uh, so what is happening is when you get your MPX uh, express generator, you can also npm it, uh, but it's fine. Use MPX. MPX express generator just goes to fetch that particular uh, project for you, that, that module. And then when you type npm install, it will start to unpack and install the stuff into your computer for you. It will install all the project's dependencies, for example, and stuff like that. And then you will be able to then run it. So it's a very important step to always remember when you, when you install, when you take a package already, uh, you fetch a package, you must remember to install it, or else it won't like go and fetch all the other dependencies that it runs on. Because if every time it ships, it ships as a gigantic thing with all dependencies, that's going to take forever. So this is just a more efficient way of, of doing things. Okay, uh, and, and also to control basically the source of the code. So for those with Windows, uh, this debug thing will not work for you. So just type npm start, that's good enough. Okay, npm start just says to, hey, spin this up. Can you type npm start? Uh, I haven't. So, so this is the, the, the joke with my cat. NPM installing because sometimes when it's really big, it takes a long time. <laughs> so you just kind of hang out. <laughs> okay, so now please go to your browser like some of you have gone already. Copy and paste or click this address. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh. Yeah, ignore me. So go to localhost 3000. Oh, I haven't started it. <laughs> so type npn start. <coughs> And then you see like, oh wow, why nothing like happening? But actually it's working, okay? So yes, I'm packed it, no, this giving it to you. Okay, so what you're gonna see is under this folder called my app 2. This is what fetching the express generator has done for you. It has created essentially like a skeleton that you can use to uh, put in your code to serve it. Okay, so you just spun up your first server. Okay, it's very exciting time. These are milestones, you know, like little things that are super important. Woo! It's like you created your first like uh, index.html page, you started working with CSS, created your first script, uh, spun up your first server, even though it's just on your computer. The same concept, eventually you take it and then you get a computer sitting elsewhere to spin that up for you. So if you want further reading, please go to Express.js and, and read the information on the generator. It just makes your life a lot easier. Dun -dun. 
And essentially, when you open the term localhost 3000, localhost just always refers to the current computer you're on. Okay, the current machine that you're on is called localhost. And the 3000 is the port number that exposes this out. So sometimes they'll tell you open localhost port 8000, port 5096. That's just a port. Okay, localhost means your current machine. So it has been configured right now to show it to you on 3000, so you see on 3000. Okay, that's just where the information is coming out from. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running over time, but we are getting to the last part of things. Um, if anyone needs to leave early, can you let me know? Are you guys good to stay for a while more? I'll try to make it faster. So this is the fun part where basically uh, you just kind of run off and, and do your create your first app. Okay, so you have spun it up already. It's ready for you to uh, fiddle with and include your to do app in later. Okay, any questions for me at this point? This is where we bring together the part one and part two from today into an app. Any questions? Okay. Uh, who is still listening to me? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, so I kind of know. Who is not listening to me? Can you raise your hands? Oh. <laughs> okay, so this is the the grand finale. Okay, so right now we are going to be building your web app. Okay, it's not just an index.html page. This comes with a server, and there are routes and things you can change. And you'll start to be able to see the difference between actually the page and the idea of a server. Because it, it can be different places. But over here, this is a back end for front end. <laughs> I call it BFF, I'm really editing. Okay, so uh, open your VS Code, yo. Close all the irrelevant stuff. Oh, I cannot terminate this. Oh, crap. Don't close your terminal, please, because it's running. <laughs> So, uh, move the to-do list uh, file from earlier just now into this application. Let me show you how. Um. Oh, really? Oh. oh, okay. It's, it's the same thing, but uh, I'm just going to open a new one so it's clearer. So inside this VS code, it is only the express um, skeleton with the static file serving everything available to you here. So there are some things that you don't have to touch. Uh, bin you ignore. Node modules are just where all your dependencies were installed. Don't go into there. It's like a never-ending hole. Um, there are public, which are basic public assets that you want to serve, like specific images and stuff. Style sheets, you can write whatever you want in it. Uh, it will be applied to your stuff. Um, views are essentially what we call um, your index.html. So these are what people see. We call them the views. Uh, over here it is J. It's just a, a templating way. So there are many ways to do the same thing. Different people have different opinions. Some people like to write it specifically, everything out. Some people just like to use templates. So they can shorten the amount of code they write. Uh, and it will be like interpreted for them. It's J interpreted. Oh, okay, it's interpret. Okay. So if you go into localhost 3000, you essentially see this. You see it says the title is Express. Welcome to Express. This is essentially what is happening inside the Jade thing. Okay. Um, there are different ways of doing things for different uh, libraries okay, or, or, or frameworks. 
So over here, their, their preference is just for Jade. I personally don't use Jade, but I think I can kind of guess what they're going at. So basically, this is just saying, hey, I have a blog content. My, oh, oh, battery. Okay. My, I want a H1 element that is equals to the variable called title. D don't get scared when looking at this right now because uh, this is just a new way of writing HTML. Okay, it's just supposed to reduce the boilerplate code. Okay, so you just need to know like what is happening is that app.js, which was created for us, is serving this file to you right now. It's serving you the index.jade, which is like an index.html. Okay, um, where that is happening, it is doing this. Okay. So what, what, what is happening over here, you can't write this kind of things inside the front end generally. Uh, it will happen in the future. Right now, you can't write it like this. This is how you write backend stuff. So if you want to say like, hey, I need all these dependencies inside, usually you start with the app.js. That's a very standard thing to use. Uh, you, these are each of them. You're requiring each of these, these modules. okay? And they are all installed for you because you have package.json that specified what your dependencies are. You need to use the express dependency because this is the generator. It's not actually express itself. It used express. Uh, you want to install Jade, which is your templating one, uh, Morgan, and cookie parser, and things like that. So this every project um, that involves NPM will have package.json, which will help you to control your dependencies and keep track of, including the versions and stuff like that. It also helps you to specify your start scripts. Um, so start, for example, actually under the hood, users node. So it, it, it goes to, uh, you node actually opens up your bin. Okay? So it just serves whatever is inside here. So don't need to know too much about it. Just know that when you type NPM and start, it will be served. Um, so generally, when things are a bit hidden from you, we call this magic. You just kind of know what it does. Really, I'm not curious. So like Ruby and Rails have a lot of magic base below it, which some programmers, I mean, for beginning, is really good, uh, and it's very easy and all that stuff. But sometimes when you try to debug things and there's too much magic, you need to like really dig into it. And when it's magic, it's like, holy, where do I start looking? OK, uh, but this is just one easy way to get started with uh, Express, the uh, Express hosted app. So when you go on app.js, you require each of these packages, which is familiar because you see it. Um, it's either, it either comes together with Express or it's from your package.json. Uh, Writing like this require is actually looking for a local route, a local file. So when you write things like, so it's OK to be lost now because this is a brand new concept, OK? You're going to see this as you go along. Just remember the way of writing this is what you write on the server, not on the front end scripts. So this bunch are just the dependencies that you're going to be using in this file. This is to say, hey, I require these dependencies for this file. Just bring it in for me. Um, then you can bring in the other files, static files that you have written, like routes, for example. So it will load these two files, routes and users. OK. Um, well, explaining route. Okay. Uh, but later. Uh, so then we will use this um, to create a reference to the Express instance that we, we are using right now. So it's saying, hey, uh, run an instance of Express for me. I will call it app. So this app is, is basically. Um, a copy of, of what is going on with Express. So then you need to set some views, for example. Um, and we go it through this directory called views. So this is just like a, a global thing. So uh, you need to look at the folder called view. And then you set a view engine called Jade. Uh, that's just what they call engine setup. Yeah, generally, I don't do. Uh, and then you can require and configure stuff. So I want to use a logger, my logger environment. I want to use a development environment, uh, things like that. And then you will also uh, app.use what comes out of this method of express.json. 
If there's any one point where you don't know what's going on, you can always do something called debugging or console logging. Okay, uh, debugging. You know, no, no debugging. Sorry, debugging is for front end. Console logging. Okay, um, and these are very pretty much very standard things. So when you want to declare to express the static route for my static items, uh, it will be you, you tell them, hey, please do it here. Please, um, this is the folder where my static assets will be. Things like images and style sheets and stuff. Generally, there's a different concept between static files and non-static files. Okay, um, and when you're doing what you call routing. Routing is basically just finding directions in the photo structure. So when you're looking at a web page and you see so much slashes as well, it's pretty much the same as you looking on your own computer in the view finder in Finder to see all the slashes. You're basically just navigating between things and files. Okay? Just that in the browser there is a new there's a funkier way of of interpreting your URL with the slashes. You can insert index and all that kind of things. But it's essentially the same concept. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get to something that is specific. You're trying to get to a place. Okay. Uh, and these are just standard error handlers that they create so that um, it will render error if something is wrong. Okay. And then um, in the back end, we definitely we need to do things like module.export. So it's like uh, if you write in a more modern way, you're going to see things like export default, uh, modules, blah, 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 stuff like that. So let's get to the more fun part and the less boring part of stuff. Uh, so this is this is the what you call the index or HTML of things. So there are two things to note over here because right now what you're seeing in this project uh, encompasses both the front and kind of the back end of stuff. It's not really the back end. How do I explain back end for front end? Uh, so uh, uh, yeah. But this thing about it, okay, just back and front end. So this thing alone is having both, okay? So your views are basically your front, your public is your front as well. And then your routes and all the things that go on behind that talks to APIs, that fetches information for you, all of that, you call that the back end. So when you're working on a project like this, whatever you're changing on the front end, when you when you change, it will, you refresh, it will change, okay? Hello. When you refresh, it's going to up, uh, update itself, okay? Uh, but when you're changing things on the back end, you kind of, in this instance, you kind of need to rerun the application. You need to kill it and then npm start again for the things that go on in the app.js. Okay, because you're, you're, you're affecting it itself. You're not just affecting the files that it's serving. You are changing stuff. I know it sounds very abstract to you right now, but it will start to clear as we go along, uh, as you go along. So over here, if we say, um, what it's referring to here in this template is a title. That's because over here, uh, very hard to explain. Uh, okay. So, uh, I think I'm going into too much details for you right now. <laughs> but anyways, what is happening is, is when when you, you are telling a router, hey, how to get where and what. Router is just how to get to something. And if you do, if you just type like this, it essentially is evaluating to this, which then gets here. And this will tell you to, hey, response rendered what? Title welcome to, change the variable welcome to Singapore. This is not going to update because uh, it is on the back end. But when you kill it and you do it again, uh, it will come back. I just want to show you a little bit of the difference between the... So remember, control C is to kill stuff on your computer. <laughs> uh, and then you start it again, and then it will update itself based on what information was fetched from the back end to push to the front end. Okay? So that's just a bit of a distinction when you're fiddling around with things yourself. So now uh, you're, you're free to go and try to add this stuff. So please copy your HTML and lesson... Um, JS into the public folder over here. You want to put it into the JavaScripts? No, just put here, yeah. So just copy and paste this whole thing into this one, okay? Uh, 
I'm just gonna drag it in. Boom. Boom. Yeah, you can just drag and drop the two files. Uh, HTML5, HTML and HTML and JS into the public folder. Right. Once it's in there, then you can start to uh, you can try to sh show the files in the browser. No need to restart. I don't think so. Go to the bathroom.
Does everyone try, kind of get the idea that your server is the one serving your files and exposing them on the route? <laughs> So we are now in the last run. I'm going to try to wrap up in the next 10 minutes where you're going to try to build this thing yourself. Uh, I'll also be talking to you a bit more about APIs. Uh, so this is really the last leg. I promise I'll try to make it faster. Uh, but these are interesting stuff. It's a bit more dry, but this is where things get very powerful. When you start to be able to write APIs and use them and all that kind of information. Okay. Um, so what you should have now is you should have on exposed on your route uh, lesson five your um, your to do list from previously, okay. So now in exercise five point two, we are basically going to build an API. Ooh. and when we when we are use, working with APIs, we use an app called Postman. I think both, most of you have installed that already. It allows you to test, try, and, and use uh, routes, okay? Uh, endpoints. So inside your folder, please go to routes and add a new file called todo.js. Inside the routes folder. Routes folder is this one, okay? So write todos.js. And then copy and paste the file, the information here into todo.js. Okay. <coughs> Remember to save the file. And then open up your app.js and add these two lines. Why 25? What you can do if you want to be neat is also to put the, the route import here. So it's together with the others. And over here you see you are basically um, adding a route 
called to do's. This is not a browser route, it's an endpoint route. Um, kill the server and restart it, okay? Because, like I mentioned earlier, when you change front end things, what the server is serving itself, you can just refresh and it will just reload. But when you change things on the actual server, the app.js, um, you need to restart things. Okay, so command or control C in your terminal and then run npm start again. Nothing will change here. It's fine. Uh, start your Postman app. Postman is this one. Okay. Click import. the repo that you are looking at right now, Mike has included this file called uh, to-do list.json. JSON is just like a JS kind of uh, information object. It's just a format. So on your postman, please uh, open up to this folder. This folder is not inside the app itself, it's inside the folder with all the notes. Okay, this is just a, a, a collection of, uh, uh, it's like a Postman collection so that you can share this kind of endpoints and information between uh, developers. So, click on this file and open it. So then when you click on collections over here, you will see the three new endpoints that will import it automatically. You can write them yourself here as well if you know how to configure them. But the easiest way to start and to share between colleagues is really just to like uh, either have the same account, uh, enterprise account, or you just import their collection. Close the request. So. This is what you call a uh, router endpoint, not router endpoint, you, um, you call it endpoints, okay, API endpoints, uh, and they are ways for you to interact with information that is in your server. So this is not the same path as the one in your browser, completely different things, please don't mix them up. Um, over here you need to write your HTTP method of what you want to do. I'll explain later on a little bit, uh, you have things like put, uh, uh, post, delete, stuff like that. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, and so this is how you are getting information from a specific uh, endpoint that is exposed to you on the internet or on your own computer. That's how you interact with it. Again, this route is different than the one that you see on your browser. Okay. But right now my server is on localhost 3000. And remember we wrote here uh, slash to do's. What is happening is that it's showing up here. So you'll go to read this file. I mean, it includes it, not read. Um, this one's, which then define on the root of to do's what happens, okay? Uh, and if I say, for example, on Postman, this is a get. It will then refer to the router method get and execute what's inside on this one. So let's send it off. Boom. So then do you see in the response, you're going to get the information that was sitting on your server? Okay. Are most people still with me? Okay. So this is extremely powerful because this is how you deal with information. You exchange, you update it, you create it. And then you store it off somewhere uh, off in the interwebs. 
And so, like for example, if you want to build an app with like a using YouTube, okay, you want to get the content from YouTube. YouTube will have a bunch of APIs, which I said just not uh, application programming interfaces that allows you to do things like to fetch videos or search for videos. They will return you usually in a format that looks like a JSON like this, with the links, the names, and all that stuff. And then you get this information and populate it inside your your view. Okay, and view is something like the index.html, the Jade. There are several different kind of ideas, but view is essentially what you're seeing. So this is an extremely powerful concept. When you get familiar and you're able to use it, you learn how to use APIs. Uh, that that's really really where you get up to the next level in building a, a full app. Or you can choose to uh, just specialize and be a front end pure front end developer. Um, so front that you don't need to touch APIs. <laughs> but generally, that's not what happens. Okay, so what you have just done is you have created a new what you call a REST API um, for managing to-do list. So isn't that exciting? You just created like a, a an API, a REST API. Is it too dry to be like exciting? I don't know. I find it really exciting. So I was there. Oh, was my phone. Um, so just a bit uh, more context. So what we have uh, gone through with you on the last part with the to-do list API is actually quite closely linked to the technical task. The second technical, uh, of the two technical tasks that uh, you can choose from, there's the second one, which is the back end API. So basically, uh, we could, uh, like, which is, I think, if you're not wrong, it's the fast timing stuff. Yeah, so we can actually use that. Uh, so that is a basis to kind of work on the backend task. If you like, you know, uh, try that. You know, um, but I understand not all of you will be, be, be able to uh, interested in doing that. But so, which is why the um, yeah, most of this tutorial or today's workshop is mostly focused on front end. So that uh, that last bit is just for those who might be interested in attempting the backend uh, bits, right? And then there are, there are ways to fetch things more specifically. Like normally when you write to do's, you can even fetch things like your ID uh, in your. So there are two ways you can you can submit the ID number uh, in the body, or you can write it in the path. So if you want to test it with Postman, you write zero. But you need to. These are things to challenge yourself. Is this if this is something you're already kind of comfortable with, then to in order to fetch one particular part of the information, maybe just this one object and not the entire collection. Yeah. Okay, so let's round it up. Um, thanks for staying with me. Uh, so basically, what exactly is a router? A router is just something that redirects you. Okay, directs you to this, directs you to that. Uh, I, I call it simply like this. So on the endpoints, you have some. Uh, the concept of CRUD and and REST are not interchangeable, but they are very. You can basically think of it as a similar thing. We call this uh, endpoint. We call something like a CRUD app. If you can do uh, four basic behaviors, which you can create it, up, um, read it, update it, delete it. Okay, and there's kind of like a bit of a corresponding HTTP method, like we saw just now on Postman. Remember to always change the method that you're trying to use on the endpoint, uh, or when you're writing your thing. Uh, you write router dot get. It's different than writing router dot post router dot uh, put. It's, it's different, so but it's very easy to forget when you're writing the, the the routes and stuff like that to forget to update the method. Okay, so remember, so then you get things like router post, router get, router put, router delete. Uh, this is basically just a read kind of function. This is a destructive one that deletes stuff. Uh, put uh, is when you're trying to update something completely. Post is usually when you create or when you update something. Okay. If anything is not clear, please feel free to post just on the Tech Ladies Facebook group for questions. Say you're referencing this slide, like I need some clarification. So that's it. You built like a full app, which is from the front end and the back end. Okay, that's like a great thing to be have done in five hours. So I just want to introduce you a little bit more of two other concepts, and then we're totally done. Uh, one is open source. The idea of sharing your code with the Rest, the rest of the developer community and the rest of the internet. So a lot of things are open source. React is open source. All that kind of things are open source. Express is open source. It is done by a group of people, uh, sometimes sponsored by companies as well, in order to put it out there to advance the, the computing and the internet for us. So that's why it's called open source. Okay, if you hear this kind of things, just remember. 
so it's it's basically like people taking their pro bono time, most of them, to contribute towards projects and stuff that everyone else can use. Some people are paid to be specifically open source. That's fine. Uh, and then, like I mentioned earlier, what is the difference between the concept of ECMAScript and JavaScript? ECMAScript is basically just a standardized version of JavaScript that is uh, determined by the ECMA International, just a group of people that come around and say, like, oh, I want to add these features into the stuff. It goes through a lot of, a lot, a lot. So you submit a proposal, it goes through a lot, a lot around evaluations, everything. Uh, it's involved with people from the industry, they get their input, stuff like that. And then sometimes the methods will then make it into the language. Okay, so you'll start to see things like ES6, ES7, whatever, uh, the kind of stuff. It just means a different version. Okay, you just need to search. Because sometimes it's not uh, fully supported by the browsers yet. Some browsers are slower at adopting new standards than others. Uh, Chrome, Firefox are generally very well on top of things. Uh, if something doesn't work on a particular browser, you can go to this website called Can I Use, which will then check, like for example, uh, array.foreach. Can I search like this? Uh, uh, for each, okay, then it's just, just for each. This is a very basic one. So almost all browsers where I created it. So then you can see, all right, IE Edge, all of them, all of them support this. You can even check things like uh, CSS selectors, whatever. Um, <coughs> then you can see like, oh, sometimes some things are only oh, CSS mask, for example, for the designers here, they are only partially supported uh, by Edge, not supported by IE, and things like this. So remember that like, technology is like a whole bunch of moving pieces going on at the same time. Um, it's not static. Yeah? And that's it. Oh. Thanks for staying with me. Sorry I got over time, but I hope you took a lot out of this. There's a lot of things to digest. Um, so, but I hope we have tried to equip you with different pieces of information. So when you try to do the assignment or you go out into the world to learn more stuff, you will be able to understand them with a broader picture. Okay, thanks. Oh, no voice. <laughs> oh.